All right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, thank you. It's just Judy for the membership. I appreciate it very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, guys, got to be careful. You definitely don't want that. Um, all right. While we're waiting, I just kind of wanted to share an insight. I mean, obviously, this morning was pretty rough. Um, but like I, I said, if you were there. <clears throat> Keen, we are back on the record in state versus Brooks appearances are as they were before. Um, I do want to make just a quick record. I am aware, didn't realize I'd gotten an email this morning from one of my staff members that Mr. Brooks's mother had written in requesting some Zoom information. She provided some email addresses I don't need the email addresses because we have simply provided the Zoom information to her to provide to the individuals that were indicated in Mr. Brooks's list. Uh, but she did ask that the email addresses uh, remain sealed and she provided an example of what could be described as a threatening email to her. And so based on that, I will have a redacted version of that email made available for the public record. It will have those email addresses um, blocked uh, and then the original will be filed under seal. Uh, again, given that threatening type of email and the reason stated in the request. Just would note again, I didn't ask for the email addresses. They were provided, uh, but under the circumstances, I think that's appropriate. Okay, with that, I presume the state has the next group available. Yes, we're ready to go, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, then go ahead, please. <clears throat> On November 21st, you killed my mother. And in this courtroom, I watched you run her down and her broken body slide across the concrete. This woman loved and she was loved. You ran her down like she was nothing. And since that day, you have shown no remorse, You'd offered no explanation for your atrocities. It offends me that you're sitting here breathing while she is not. You are a monster. You deserve contempt and death. Sadly, with no death penalty in this state, I can only hope they lock you away someplace so deep the rats chew on your fingers at night. As for me, this will never be over until the day I'm pissing on your grave. I think it would be fair to say that for your crimes, even God hates you. If you could just tell me, oh, go ahead. Yeah, the record, Your Honor, that was the son of victim two. B. Um, if I could first thank the court, uh, you, Your Honor, and your staff for getting us here today. I don't know how you did. Uh, you kept this under four weeks, and uh, this is all going to be wrapped up, you know, before the first anniversary, and that means a lot. So I thank you for that. And uh, if I could thank everybody at the prosecution table, our real life Avengers, I mean, you guys did everything you could for us and I'm, I'm forever grateful. Thank you. And uh, I couldn't not thank Jen Dunn and her staff. I mean, she took all of us, supported us, made us into a family. And with, without them, I don't think I could have gotten through this trial. And Mr. Brooks, I hope as I read my statement, you continue to roll your eyes. I hope you continue to laugh and just show how bored and unmoved you are by all of this, because I think that's important. It's important for the world to see that evil can be a tangible, living, breathing thing. I think it's important for the world to see what human rot looks like. And to all the survivors, every time he puts his hand on that empty cavity where his heart should be, I hope you all smile. And I hope you take solace in the fact that today is our day. Today is for us. Today is so we can take our handful of dirt, throw it on his grave, and move on. Because that's what we all need, and that's what we deserve. My name is Chris Owen, and I am the plaintiff. I'm here on behalf of another plaintiff, my mother, Leanna Joy Owen. Lee Owen was a mother, a grandmother, a best friend, an apartment manager, and a dancing granny. The reason none of the witnesses saw her in this courtroom is because she was executed by a child killing sex offender. And we are both injured parties. My whole family is an injured party. To my kids, Lee Owen was nanny. And nanny spoiled her grandkids every chance she got. 
On every birthday, she would call and sing happy birthday to their voicemail so they could hear it the first thing in the morning. She went on a tour of my son's summer camp. She danced in the same parades as my youngest daughter. She wanted my oldest daughter to use her car to learn how to drive so she could teach her like she taught me. And all of that has been ripped away. But the defendant's conscience is clear. To my dad, Lee Owen was the love of his life. They met when she was 16 and he taught her how to drive. From that point on, they stayed in each other's lives. And even though they divorced, she was still his best friend. They spent a lot of time together and she was the only one that, who could get him out of the house. Now my dad has nightmares of her body flying through the air and shattering against concrete. But Mr. Brooks' conscience is clear. To my brother and I, Lee Owen was our mother. A mother who even when she was str struggling was always there for us. She was supportive of us. She always told us how proud she was of us. Growing up, all my friends and my brother's friends knew they were welcomed at our house. When they were in trouble, having problems at home or just had to get away, she always let them stay as long as they needed to. And for years, every time I came home from the Marine Corps, she got all those same friends together so I could see everybody and spend time with them. She was the one that made sure everyone got their Christmas list out on time. She made the best eggnog I ever had. And she made my grandma's mac and cheese whenever we were together. She recently renewed her passport so she could visit my wife and I in Turkey and travel the world with us. She also couldn't wait to visit Machu Picchu with my brother. It was her dream trip. Out of all the places in, in the world, that was the one place she had to visit before she died. And now the best we can do is lay her ashes there. But Daryl Brooks' conscience is clear. And I believe him. Out of everything he said in this courtroom, I believe that is the one truth he told. I mean, how else could he make a witness look at each of his battered friends that he ran over and ask, how do you know who this is? Throughout her life, Lee Owen was a hardworking woman. That's why when she found herself on hard times, she was able to overcome them. Even though it took years, she dug herself out of a deep financial hole so she could live the life she wanted, the life she deserved. And she was in the middle of doing just that on the evening of November 21st, 2021. And I know this is corny and cliche to say, but Lee Owen wasn't 71 years old. She was 71 years young. She was one of the most active people I knew. She just didn't have it in her to sit still. She always had to be moving or doing something. And this often involved people. She was very social and loved being around those she cared about. And people loved her back. She had a knack for making you feel good about yourself without even trying because she always found the good in people. Even when it was to her detriment, it never dissuaded her from helping people any way she could. Without judgment, without demand for repayment or feeling she was owed anything. She did it because she knew it was the right thing to do and it made her feel good. She accepted people for who they were and made people feel good about themselves. That is what the world lost and you have the audacity to tell this court that your conscience is clear. I'm sorry, Mr. Brooks. There's not a human with a soul on this planet who could snuff that light out, who could steal Lee Owen from this world and have a clear conscience. And that is why you hear the term monster. That is why you hear the term demon. You know, I saw you that day. It was just after you ran over the Catholics. I saw you hanging out of the window, looking back with a smile of satisfaction on your face, laughing at an inside joke that at the time I didn't get, the punchline escaping me. I didn't get it when my mom didn't respond to my texts. I didn't get it when she didn't answer my phone calls. I didn't get it the first couple hours my brother spent looking for. I didn't get it until my wife sent me a video of you running over children in the parade. That's when I got the punchline. And it hit me like the red SUV, Mr. Brooks. I saw a pure, unrepentant evil in your face that day. And it disgusts me that you are allowed to exist. And I know the answer to the question that everyone keeps asking. I know why you did this. You did this simply because you were not in a cage. That is what I find mind boggling. And how dare anyone say the system failed him. The system failed every one of us whose only mistake was to bring their families in the vicinity of Mr. Brooks. 
That poor excuse for a man should not have been on the streets. That is the failure, period. But enough about him. Because today is not about him. It's about us and what we lost. I lost my mom, Lee Owen. And I wasn't always a good son. I could be selfish sometimes. I could be mean. But no matter how angry or standoffish I got, she would bend over backwards for me, even when I didn't deserve it. And now I can never tell her I'm sorry. I can never tell her I should have been more grateful. I can never tell her how much I need her in my life. Yeah, shake your head. Shake your head. You know, because that is what you took from me. And there's, there's nothing this court can do that would provide justice in my eyes. So all I ask is that you rot, and you rot slow. Bravo. Oh, that fucking clap. I'm sorry. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Um, th thank you for the opportunity uh, that you're providing both to myself and uh, to the rest of the families and uh, acquaintances of uh, the folks associated with this uh, with this horrible case. Um, my name is Michael Carlson, and I'm appearing here today both as an individual and a brother uh, to one of the victims of November 21st. I'm here today as well as a plaintiff joining a criminal complaint against Mr. Brooks with a claim against him for the damage that he has brought not only to Waukesha, but to my family. And I'm also appearing as a posthumous spokesman for the victim, my sister, Tamara Durand, who can't appear here today on her own behalf because Mr. Brooks killed her. In my personal aspect, I wish I could as easily forget about Mr. Brooks as he has seemingly forgotten about himself. Every day, since November 21st has been, been, been framed by what he did in my own life, in our family's life. It is the reality I wake to. It is the reality I head to work to. It is the reality I confront as I try to fall asleep. It's the reality I confront as I go about the things I do during the day, my attempts to work, attempts to manage a household and be present for my children maintaining any sort of notion of normalcy in our life. But all these actions are simply a pantomime, Mr. Brooks, to forget that my sister was so stupidly and so needlessly killed by you. Perhaps you can forget what you did, but I can't. November 21 looms as a ground zero day in the story of my life, as I know it does in the life of so many others. <clears throat> I appear today also as a plaintiff. Mr. Brooks, you asked the court to identify a plaintiff many times during the, the course of the trial. Here I am. I'm one of many. We, the people, have brought this case and these judgments against you, Mr. Brooks. They reflect our values as a people and are enacted through laws passed by our legislatures, enforced by our law, law enforcement, and, in, and administered through our courts. We, the people, find you guilty. A lifetime is a long time to think and to spout nonsense. And Mr. Brooks, I want you to take no comfort in your, in your future here in this comic book cartoon world that you've created for yourself involving, involving the flags and, and barcodes and birth certificates. This is all nonsense, the stuff of teenage boys on the internet. That's not why you're here today. That's not why we're here today. We're here today and you are here today because you got in a car and instead of hitting the brakes, ran over children, elderly, and my sister, Tamara. I don't want you to live in the comfort of that delusion as you live there in the court, mm -hmm. as you live there in the prison convincing yourself that you're the victim of something, of some crazy internet conspiracy. You're not Mr. Brooks. You're guilty only of your own actions on that day, actions that you had an infinite number of times to stop. Any number of times you could have just hit those brakes, turned the other direction. 
as it stands, I'm not a pla- I'm a plaintiff, but I'm not a victim. The victim is Tamara Durand, my sister. She can't appear, appear her on her own behalf because she is dead. She died when Mr. Brooks killed her on November 21st. Because Tamara cannot be here to speak, I will speak for her. Daryl Brooks, you took my life. I wish you hadn't. I had people to live for, people who needed me. My parents who are aging, my children who need their mother to help them make sense of their worlds, to cheer them on, to help them into their adulthood, to become friends with them. I have my grandson who relies on me, his grandmother, as much as I relied upon my own grandmother as I was growing up. I had people who needed me, people who needed me to cheer them on, to have me bring goodwill to the hospital bed where they were in, or their families in the waiting room, who needed the comfort and prayers I brought to them in their moments of pain. I have friends who near to hear from me and families that need my early morning phone calls. I had places I wanted to see and things I needed to do. The only saving grace is I didn't know what hit me. And who would have ever guessed? Who could ever believe it? It's no surprise to anyone who knew me. After you hit me in that car, I got back up and kept dancing. I hardly skipped a beat. I didn't know you, Mr. Brooks. If the picture were reversed, if you were the stranger in the street in pain, needing care or comfort, Know that I would have helped you. I ran towards pain and I ran into danger in my life. All you had to do was ask and you might have danced along with us. It was a parade after all. We both died in vain on November 21st, Mr. Brooks. I died to life and you now die to the world. We leave lives behind, family behind, children behind us. We both leave dreams, We leave choices, we leave successes, we leave failures behind us. I die to mine in an instant, you die to yours over countless days. May the God I'm with grant you the courage to confront what you've done and to remember your own name. It's the least you might do for all these that you've left behind us who will never, who can never forget. Mr. Brooks, I'd also like to acknowledge that over these last couple months, I've sent you a couple letters in prison, urging you to stand up, to be a man, to grow up, to accept accountability for what you've done. I also use those letters to share with you the love of the God that I believe in and that I know my sister Tamara believed in. I use those letters to share with you, especially the story of the final act of Christ on the cross, where he is hanging between two murderers, and he turns to the one and he, and, and he give, gives them forgiveness. I urge you to remember, Mr. Brooks, that there were two murderers on that day. One who mocked the holy living in God, when one who accepted accountability for who he was. Your Honor, I urge you to provide Mr. Brooks a lifetime in prison to please contemplate that story and to remember his name and to contemplate which side of Christ he wishes to hang on. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Again, just powerful stuff. The family of victim A is going to speak next. Um, They do have some minors with them, so I'd just like to give the um, camera a second to adjust for that. And also, one of the minors um, does wish to make a statement and is somewhat vertically challenged. Um, I'm wondering if she should stand over so that you may see her or. Um, sure. Is she be taken out before I ha- uh, have them come up. I believe Mr. Brooks was uh, attempting to get the court's attention. So let me address him quickly. Oh God. Um, I wanted to uh, order the court, if I may really quick pertaining to the, um, the last speaker i have an issue with if you no, will, don't do if that. it pleases the court we can address it later or if you want to address it now i don't 
Just to make sure. These are sentencing remarks. I'm not going to interrupt those sentencing remarks to have you address him individually. No, I'm not talking about addressing him individually. Then what are you talking about? Mr. Brooks, we're going to continue. I'm not sure what you could possibly bring to the court's attention. Don't you dare. About a speaker who's already made a statement. Don't you dare. The issue that I can bring to the you court. You put it in writing, sir, while you're sitting there. And if it's something- I Shut the hell up and sit down. And I'm not going to disrupt what's happening right now to address that. You need Taze to put him. it in writing. All right, go ahead, uh, Ms. So put it in writing that- Mr. Brooks. Please put it in writing. That's you the, need same, paper that's the same person you had to work with the father of, right? Go ahead, um, Ms. Dunn. You speak for all of us. Like I said, the record the same speaks for itself. All of those issues were previously put on the record. There's no need for you to make any that commentary is him though, about right? it. He did work with his father, though, right? Mr. Brooks, stop. If you interrupt me again, you're going to risk going into the other courtroom. I'm not going to have so you hold degrade me the integrity of these proceedings. I'm not, I'm not the attempting to cause of what's controversy. Going on right I just now. wanted to know. That I'm once again trying to derail what's happening. And, and you always talk of, about somebody trying to derail something as if that, that was the plan. Like somebody coming Mr. here Brooks, to derail something. I'm advising something. you to be quiet or I will clear this courtroom. And under Illinois versus Allen, you will lose your right to be present while the remainder of these individuals give their statements. Okay, well, come on with it. Oh God! Once they start, I expect you to come be on quiet. with it, because that—that's what you've been waiting to do the whole time. Shit. Listen up and listen what she has to say. All right. God damn, sir, you're gonna have to be removed. I'm sorry, I can't tolerate that from anyone, Mr. Brooks. My admonishment to you is the next person is going in the to gallery. get up, and they're going to start their statement. And okay, yeah, but you made it seem like I'm trying to. Oh my God! Shut up, that. Mr. Brooks. And that's—I don't think I'm that that's fair to, to do that. Please be quiet. Okay. Yeah, I still have the uh, First Amendment right to be heard and to and to be to speak. No, forget the other room. Have that right. Mr. Brooks, this is there. a sentencing hearing. I don't the care what is it is. Speaking. You're not right. going to continue. He is arguing you're with not, me. He is now for You're not going to continue. You're not going to continue. Everyone is to the next uh, courtroom, and I'll make the appropriate findings up. when I'm able to do that. So can I get a finding of fact? Can I get a legal finding of fact? Because I don't agree to a stop it. All right. Well. That didn't take long. I was surprised we made it through the morning. If I'm being honest with you. Wow. All right. Well, some fantastic first uh, few witnesses. That was great. Um, wow. Jeez. All right. Uh, where do I go with that? I don't even know what he was going to try and argue. Yeah. Night, if only that were possible. I would absolutely love it. Or, you know, how about the Marine? We just put him in the other room with him. Um, let's put it this way. I thought a, uh, I thought that last guy... Definitely a uh, lower temperature. Yeah. Yes, he did. And I'm trying to think of why. It was definitely lower temperature. Um, I think that he had an issue with reading the letter in the voice of the victim. Probably, if I would guess, that's the closest thing to something that it's not right, but at least something maybe. Um, but uh, just... Uh, it did not take long. Yeah, you're right. It's because they were focusing on the victims and not him. Um, is that the case? <clears throat> I mean, it's a small community. And, you know, you did run over an entire parade. So I imagine that people are going to know each other in the community. That's not an issue. 
He had nothing to do with your guilt phase. God, if only they could. If only they could. I would be so happy. Yeah, that could have something to do with it. Which, again, you have every right in the world to write a letter to somebody. You don't have to open it. But I thought that was really powerful. I mean, I didn't know how he was going to follow. When he started off with kind of a quieter tone, I didn't know how he was going to follow the other guy. But he did a fantastic job. Yeah, go ahead, Tammy. I just don't get involved in, like, individual stuff. But yeah, if it's a general question, post it up and I'll try to answer. All of them, literally all of them, most of the defendants he's seen half a dozen times. He knows them on a first name basis. Like that's not an argument. Make him really popular all of a sudden. Uh, let's see. You know, Tammy, send it to me in a Twitter DM. Let's do it that way. Yeah, that's that's the issue. And it'll be interesting when you have it'll be interesting when you have the uh, when you have the mother and the grandmother testify because that's where he got it from. I mean, he got the soft stuff from jail, but I think but he got the victim mentality from um, them. First of all, we are back on the record. Mr. Brooks has been removed to the other courtroom. Uh, Mr. Brooks, you're not muted. So if you're gonna keep talking, I'll have to mute you. All right, so I've muted him as you could see. And here, um, he was not muted initially. Um, I will advise there is a headset next to him should he wish to uh, put those on. Uh, this court, frankly, acted a bit more swiftly than I have in the past due to the nature of the proceedings, the history of Mr. Brooks's outbursts during the trial, and uh, him attempting to address an issue that was addressed by this court the very first time I ever uh, had Mr. Brooks in the courtroom dealing with um, victim C's father, and, a, and this court uh, certainly working with him in the past. I stand by the record that was made at that time. All of that was put on the record and um, it's not an issue this court frankly needs to address today. It is frankly a blatant attempt by Mr. Brooks to be disruptive, uh, to take the focus off of what I think is some very emotionally charged victim uh, statements here today from uh, those who have been involved with the Dancing Grannies and uh, people who lost their lives on November 21 of 2021. Um, I 
warned him a couple of times, even in my words, backtracked a little, told him I would have the state uh, put, have the next victim <laughs> make the statement. And if he then interrupted, I would have him removed. Um, he wanted to debate with me. He interrupted me repeatedly. And at that point, <clears throat> there was also an outburst by a member of the gallery. I addressed that. Um, and uh, then I indicated the courtroom would uh, be cleared. Um, I think I owe it to the individual who was kicked out because I've given Mr. Brooks this opportunity on many occasions. If that individual would like to come back into the courtroom and can do so respectfully without an outburst, they are invited back in by this court. Good. Very good. Mr. I'm Brooks, glad I will also that. advise you that you are welcome back into this courtroom if you can abide by the rules of decorum and civility. Um, while you have a right to be present for this sentencing hearing, you do not have a right uh, to interrupt the court, to disrupt the court, uh, and to be defiant, which is how I would describe your very recent behavior. Um, and that is why this court, under the authority in Illinois versus Allen, uh, did remove you from the courtroom. I have the ability, of course, with the technology, he's able to hear, he's able to see, we are able to see him. He's muted right now. Um, and uh, while I attempted to have him appear without being muted, he uh, spoke over me. Um, if he wants to come back in before it is his turn to speak to the court and present uh, individuals who wish to speak on his behalf, he needs to simply ask the bailiff. And then of course, uh, abide by the rules of civility and decorum. I agree very much. Thank you guys so much. Of course, a very emotional day for many people here, if not all. Um, and I think even more today than any other day, um, respect needs to be what guides everyone in this courtroom um, and not interrupting and not having outbursts, no matter how difficult the situation may get at times. She's fantastic. So I've made the record. Um, I will unmute, um, but if there is any interruption whatsoever, I'll have to uh, mute him once again. So the unmute is off. And once again, I've confirmed that the technology is working and, um, um, all right, what do you need to do? Yeah, but still, they... She did it so clean so far. I, I don't think that just keep with the same process you've been going with. He will be able to hear. He may not be able to see the individuals speaking. I would note all the podium is um, behind him in any event. Prosecution will be able to. He's turned back. Yes, they'll get the last say in terms of requesting the actual and, sentence. Um, it's standard, really, protocol. For but the they're not really going to speak that forward, So I don't see any issue with that. He will be able to here um, with that. Um, we, we will need to screen share um, for the next speakers, Your Honor. There's some photos that we'd like to display just to give right. a heads up on that. I believe Madam Clerk will be able to. Thank you. Do that for Thank us. Very much. <laughs> when we get that up and running, then the next person can come on up. Looks like it's working. All right, thank you, sir. If, as a reminder, if you would at least let me know your name if you want to, or son of victim so-and-so, that would be very helpful as I am trying to take notes of everyone who is making a statement. Um, no, you are not muted. I expect you to be quiet as the proceedings continue. I was just unmuted, I didn't know. I'm sorry for the interruption, sir. Please continue or please start. My name is Marshall Sorensen, and I am son to a murdered mother, Virginia Sorensen. On a day that I was planning to put up a Christmas tree with my family, I received a call from my dad that would turn my whole family's world upside down. When I answered the phone, my dad told me something happened to your mother during the parade and she didn't make it. I said, what do you mean she didn't make it? 
My dad proceeded to tell me that she was killed. Of course, I didn't believe him at first, but when I hung up the phone, reality set in. As I wiped the tears from my eyes, I thought to myself how I was going to tell my two little girls as they wait in the other room to put up the Christmas tree that they will never see their grandma again. As a parent, one of the hardest things to endure is to see your family in pain. Witnessing my daughter's hearts get shattered into a million pieces in an instant that night, trying to understand what happened to their Grammy is something I wish to this day I could make go away. I loved my mom unconditionally and so did my family. My mom would jump at the opportunities to spend time with my daughters. I was blessed with having that opportunity with my mom, but my girls were cheated out of that because of the acts of one evil person. Mr. Brooks, you had mentioned that you will never get to be able to get the chance to hold your grandchild. To that, I say good. Maybe then, while you're locked behind bars, you will experience a little bit of the pain that you inflicted on six families when you killed their loved ones during a Christmas parade. My family will never get the chance to hug my mom one last time and say goodbye because of your actions. You will never understand what you took from my family and by your actions in court, you don't seem to care either. You murdered my mom and for that reason, I'm asking the judge to sentence you to life in prison without parole. I continue to have a hard time understanding why such a loving person like my mom had her life ended in a tragic way. But I do have some peace knowing that she left this earth doing something she loved. I encourage people now after a year that if someone asks you how my mom died, Virginia Sorensen, that you respond with, let me tell you how she lived because that is what made her so special to so many people. When I was a kid, most of my superheroes wore capes. As of today, myself and family, we have a new one and she wears a robe. Thank you, Judge Darrow. Words cannot express my family's gratitude with the time and effort you put into this trial. I want to also thank Sue, Zach, Leslie, Detective Casey, Jen, Pepper, the witnesses, the jury for the sacrifices they made so justice could be served. Lastly, I want to thank the city of Waukesha for their community of love and support they displayed towards our family during this time. Going forward, my family re will refuse to live in fear because of the acts of one evil person. My family will continue to attend parades and at this year's Waukesha Christmas Parade, we plan on walking with the dancing grannies. We will do this in remembrance of my mom and show that we are stronger together. I ask you today to please remember the picture shown on the screen during this year's Waukesha Christmas Parade. This picture was taken before a previous parade. My hope for you is that it reminds you of the true representation of what the Waukesha Christmas Parade stood for before this tragic event, which is the unconditional love between families while celebrating the spirit of Christmas. May angels watch over you and you remain strong. I would like now to bring up my daughter, Brooke, to say a couple words about her grandma. She held the banner with my mom at previous parades as shown in the picture above. Thank you for being here, young lady. What would you like to tell me? Hello, my name is Brooke Sorensen. I'm Virginia Sorensen's granddaughter. The things I that the things I miss about my grandma are me and my sister Mackenzie doing foot races around the driveway, and my grandma would do commentary and time us. She always wait, she always cheered us on at all of our activities. I would DJ at dancing granny parties and carry the banner at parades with my grandpa while Grammy danced. When we would get on the school bus, she would say reading is the key to learning to be nice, kind, brave, and angels watch over you. After school, we would talk on the porch. Other times when we came when we came over to our house, we would play games together, go to the playground, have drawing contests, dance parties, and work on granny routines. She would give us snacks when we watched some of our favorite movies like Polar Express and Coco. 
When we first found out that she was gone, I started to cry, and I would cry every night. I missed her so much and still do today. Daryl Brooks, you took her from me, my sister, and my family. The things we will miss the most are not seeing her again, her smile, her laugh, being able to talk to her, and doing fun things with her. My sister and I pray every night for our Grammy and our family. Grammy, I'll see you in my dreams. I'm being told Mr. Brooks would like to come back. Before I do that, sir, I need a pledge from no, you. No, don't do it. No, me. please, God, no. Courtesy please. of Corman, you will not interrupt. No. Do that, sir? no, 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 no. I'm not going to interrupt. All right, then I will give him that opportunity uh, to come back. We'll clear the courtroom while we do that. Thank you. We'll take a brief recess. What a brave little girl. She was... She was adorable. And her dad, seriously, that, that scene of finding out while they're making the Christmas tree, it just, oh, God. It's, it's really, that's heartbreaking. I just, that's the thing is it's like, when you think about it, it's like the high school marching band, the local baseball team, the dancing grannies and like the Catholic contingent to the, it's like, these are all just so wholesome community institutions that were just, just shattered. I, like you couldn't, I mean, it's just the concept of the dancing grannies is so freaking wholesome. I just, oh my God. And to have that destroyed, I mean, I, I, I don't know, like communities need these sorts of events to bring themselves together these days. That's how, that's how you avoid this sort of problem. That's how you avoid these sorts of issues in society, generally speaking, is it's like, you know, your local bowling league, your local church group, that sort of thing. I, we need more of these sort of lower level institutions to bring people together. And for somebody to directly attack them like that is really just, ah, it's just brutal. It's tear, it's trying to tear society apart and he failed, thank God, but I'm sure it's not exactly going to be a super Merry Christmas this year. It's going to be a lot of, a lot of memories that come back up. So I just, I feel, I feel terrible. Like I'm, I'm so proud of that community and how strong they're staying, but it's still going to be a really rough holiday season for them. There's no two ways about that. Ah, it's just terrible. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, the Memorial Day Parade uh, at my, uh, used to start in front of my house when I was back in New York uh, when I was a kid. And we put out bagels and coffee for the firefighters as everybody was lining up and, you know, the Boy Scouts and stuff. And it was just such a special occasion. Um, and to, to destroy that, it's just ugh, it's disgusting. It really is. Thanks, Gremlin. I appreciate it. I just, I just speaking from the heart. Like those things really are important to communities. Yeah, tree lighting ceremonies. Um, at the village hall, we would do like sports events and a cookout for 4th of July. Like all those things that bring these communities together. You get to know your neighbors. It, we're starting to, re like people are attacking those. And those are the institutions that make communities what they are. It's okay. I mean, again, that's, I said it earlier, and I don't know if everyone was here for it, but the reason we're doing this, it's, it's rough, but it's important because he kept asking who's the victim, who's the victim. And one of the, one of the victim impact statements pointed it out, we are the people speaking, the people whose loved ones you took away from them, the people that you injured. Um, those are the victims. And I think 
because we, you know, we're in this for the long haul, I think it's important to hear these things to see, you know, because again, we were laughing about box forts and his shenanigans and all of that, but there is, this is the serious side behind all of it, really, when it comes down to it. And I think that is important to see. Oh, absolutely the same, Knight, 100%. Been advised that there may be an issue with the screen in front of Mr. Brooks, but I would note that the large monitor that's directly above the witness stand and the other monitor, which is closer to Mr. Brooks behind uh, the clerk, has been working the entire time. Um, Zach may be coming in to look at it, but we'll keep going while that happens since uh, we are able to see and hear that way through the monitors. So. Um, Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. I didn't know it caused that disruption. Can the state put something up and I'll That was like way earlier. It's working. Okay, great. It's working. All right. My apologies, sir, for that interruption. Yeah, it was Judge, I bumped the power button. All right. Well, there's nothing on. Yeah, you did. There's okay. nothing on it at the moment. Okay. Yeah. As long as you cut that issue. Okay. Court, really quick. No, we're gonna keep going, sir. I just, I just wanted to. No. Oh my God. This is why you don't bring him back in. That's, that's all I wasn't to all right. I address anything. That, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I really do. All right, go ahead, sir. My name is Sean Sorensen, Virginia Sorensen's oldest son. Without warning, on a joy filled Sunday in November, our family and others were devastated by an unfathomable act of evil. My mother, Virginia Sorensen, Jenny, a loving and devoted grandmother to six, mother to three, sister to three, and wife of 56 years to my father and friend to countless others was taken from us for no comprehensible reason. My mom didn't let her age of 79 slow her down, be it the dancing grannies, her horses, dogs, cats, chickens, travel, working as a medical records nurse, holiday get-togethers, the occasional brandy old-fashioned, and having sleepovers and movie parties with her grandchildren. She enjoyed the company of, of others and was always up for an adventure. She never tired of listening to her grandchildren's dreams and inspiring them to shoot for the stars. She was so proud of all six of them in this photo. Carter, Claire, Gabrielle, Savannah, Brooke, and Mackenzie. She was killed doing something she loved and enjoyed with the dancing grannies. And although we were denied the chance to be her with her when she passed, we know she was surrounded by friends and the caring strangers who sought to save her life. So we find comfort that she not die alone. She was a compassionate person. She was always telling us, God bless you, or angels watch over you. She will be missed with an aching emptiness in all our hearts. Judge Doro, thank you for overseeing this trial. You define excellence in your profession, and we are so grateful you were assigned to this case. Thank you to the 12 jurors of this strong community who carefully and unbiasedly listened to the evidence and brought back 76 guilty verdicts. Thank you, Sue Opper, Leslie Basie, Zach Wichow, and the entire Waukesha District Attorney's team for ensuring Mr. Brooks would not escape the consequences of his despicable actions. Thank you, Detective Tom Casey, and the many law enforcement officers of Waukesha and other jurisdictions who investigated 
collected evidence, and testified to ensure Dale Brooks will never be a free man. Detective Casey came to my dad's house in the early morning hours of November 22nd to deliver the heart-wrenching confirmation that my mother had passed, and he has greeted us every day in court since then. I wanna thank the Victim Witness Program, Jen Dunn, her staff, and their best comfort dog, Pepper, for their kindness and constant comfort to all the families affected this past year. She and her office have been a rock for us to cling to when events have threatened to emotionally overwhelm us. I wanna thank the Waukesha Women's Center for supporting Corey Runkle and Erica Patterson in their testimony against Mr. Brooks and his abuse, and the good that the center does for other abused women. I wanna thank the first responders and medical personnel at the parade who rendered aid to the injured and attempted to save my mother's life that night. And a nurse that we met at the memorial one night by chance, Sarah, who held my mother's hand that night. But she was already dead A severed spine, multiple skull fractures, pelvic fractures, and her Christmas hat wedged under the windshield wipers of the Ford SUV. There was no ambulance ride or hospital stay. She was gone in a split seconds after Mr. Brooks smashed into her, but she will live on forever in our hearts. Finally, I would like to thank the Waukesha community and thousands of others for their outpouring of love and prayers to the families and victims of this unspeakable tragedy. I have few words for Mr. Brooks. Just saying that name brings anger and hatred into my heart. And I wanna move forward after this sentencing with the happy memories I hold of my mother. I sat silently almost every day in this courtroom, bit my tongue, restrain myself from jumping over this divide to administer my thoughts of justice. As Mr. Brooks droned on about where the plaintiff was in this case, who the plaintiff was in this case. You've already heard, there are many plaintiffs here. I'm here right now. I've been here all along. And now he gets to hear from me and from many other plaintiffs before this day is over. He is simply a repulsive man who has shown zero remorse for his actions and depraved indifference to life. His fake tears in court were never for those harmed, but only for himself and the freedom he has lost. His narcissistic behavior, disgusting trial antics, and defiance to accept any accountability displays how truly unworthy he is of anyone's forgiveness. While we lost my mom instantly, I hope his 76 sentences pass in a slow, miserable, depressing existence as a reminder of the many lives he shattered. There are two others I hold culpable in my mother's murder. Dawn Woods, the mother who knew her son's felonious criminal history and penchant for violence, yet bailed him out of jail for $1,000 after he insulted Erica Patterson by running her over with Miss Woods' Ford Escape. She continued to allow him to drive it and enabled his violence and murders that Sunday afternoon. The other is John Chisholm, the Milwaukee County District Attorney, whose misguided and ill-conceived bail reform policies led a violent multi-convicted felon back into our community and onto our streets while already out on bail from a previous violent felony. Mr. Chisholm disregarded his duty to keep the people of this community and state safe from repeat criminal offenders and allowed a career criminal to snuff out six innocent lives. He is a coward who hides from the accountability for his office's negligence. If he had a tiny single sliver of integrity, he would resign. Not once has Mr. Chisholm said three simple words to these victims and families. I am sorry. At least Miss Woods in her many media interviews has a humanity and understanding to say those words to the families affected. Six families have been bound together forever in grief. 
Six families have lost loved ones who are cherished and can never be replaced, but forever remembered with love. Six names I will now never forget. Jane, Jackson, Bill, Tammy, Lee, and Ginny. As my mom was fond of saying, angels watch over us. And I know now there are six more watching over us. Judge Doral, my request is simple. Maximum terms of imprisonment, every single charge, life without parole for all six counts of intentional homicide. Thank you and all who played a role in bringing justice to the families and this community. Oh, he's gonna explode. But this guy said what needed to be said with regard to the mother, with regard to bail reform, all the things that led to this monster being able to be where he was. I'm David Sorensen, Virginia Sorensen's husband of 56 years. And I'm wearing this dancing granny sweatshirt in her memory. A few thank yous, first of all. Thank you, Judge Doral, you earned your angel wings in this trial. Thank you to the jurors and those who testified who had to experience the horror of November 21st of last year all over again. Thank you, District Attorney Sue Upper, Leslie, Zach, and her excellent team. Thank you to Tom Casey, Waukesha Law Enforcement, first responders both on and off duty at the parade, medical personnel at the parade and the area hospitals that cared for the injured. Thank you, Jan Dunn, and your caring team in the victim witness office, especially my new furry friend, Pepper. Here's a thank you that nobody knows about. Thank you to JJ Watt. He's a professional football player for the Arizona Cardinals who gave up, gave this community um, money for funerals for the victims, six family funerals. Finally, thank you to the kind and compassionate people of Waukesha County, state of Wisconsin and others from around the country and the world who have helped the victims of the Waukesha Christmas Parade find comfort, shared in their loss and sorrow, prayed for the injured and offered words of caring so that we may heal both physically and mentally. Although I have very specific thoughts on how I and the parade families would want revenge on the convicted for what he did, I hand over his fate now to God. So I will let God determine the revenge I ask for, be it a week, a month, a year, a lifetime. I think it's fair to say the convicted is an evil animal, and I hope that God's wrath falls upon him. It actually started before the trial did because he took away his own God-given name. He didn't want to be known by his name. I refuse to accept him. I refuse to accept him as a person that deserves compassion or mercy. I too regret Wisconsin does not have the death penalty because if someone ever deserved it, the convicted most certainly does. Life in prison is too kind. That Bible on your table will not do you any good for where you will end up. I have struggled this past year with Jenny's loss. It was to be her last parade. She was going to retire. <clears throat> I will continue to struggle with the loss. I am lucky to have family to care for me and wrap me in love so that I can start to glue together the shattered life I now have. I know Jenny probably saved our two granddaughters who sit behind me, their lives by carrying the banner that day in their place. And I thank God for that. The life that Jenny and I built over 56 years of marriage was forever altered nearly a year ago. 
I will carry on in this new life with help from my family and friends. The life I was once able to share with Jenny is gone, but it has strengthened my family's closeness and in a way made us stronger for the great challenges we have ahead of us. I feel sorry she will not be able to hold a great grandchild or see all of her children, grandchildren be successful in life. But I pray to her and know she is watching over us. My Christian faith and church have helped me cope with my sadness and find hope and love over hate. My friends have lifted me up in their prayers. My family carries my burden with me. My dogs at home give me a small measure of comfort when I am in need. Angels will watch over all of us and give us strength. Now I want you to use your imagination a little bit. When it thunders, I imagine that Jackson is blasting a home run over the fence. When there is a rainbow, I will imagine the dancing grannies, Jenny, Tammy, Lee, and Bill with them dancing along its lines. When there's a ray of sunshine poking through the clouds, I will imagine it is Jane smiling down on us. When it snows like it did this morning, I will imagine God's love giving us a blanket in comfort. When I see a blue light, I see this community's commitment to help heal and support each other. Judge, you have witnessed the same evil I have. You have endured a very emotional and draining that trial as I have. I ask for the full punishment within your power. I ask you to send this evil animal to life in prison with no chance for parole for the callous murder of my wife and five others and injuring 61 others. He should never have the opportunity to hurt another person and has forfeited his right to be a free man ever again by his violent actions against innocent lives, both young and old. You are a very evil, evil animal. Amen. Amen, and screw you with the freaking chest pounding, bastard. Thank you. <clears throat> I have one very brief statement from a young woman who was marching with the grannies. And then we have, I believe, three statements from one more family before the next group will have to be brought in. Um, this is a statement from a young woman who was holding the banner with the grannies. And she marked down that the crime made her feel sad, mad, scared, and then also wrote in valuable asked if you were the judge, what would you do to the offender? She checked, send them to prison. And then her own idea of make the offender go through the physical and emotional pain I went through. Do it. Do it. Let's put him in front of a truck and run him over. I give him five minutes in a locked room with the Marine. Thank you. My name is Taylor Kulik. Standing next to me is my oldest son, Robert. I am the oldest daughter of my mother, Jane Kulik, and it is on her behalf that I will be making a statement today as she's unable to speak for herself. November 21st, 2021, the day my life was forever changed. 
the day my mom was murdered. It's still hard to believe that my mom was killed while marching in a Christmas parade. I will never forget that day. When I received the phone call stating that my mom had been hit, I rushed to the hospital to find her. Within minutes of arriving at Waukesha Memorial, people of all ages flooded into the ER, many injured, many searching for their family members, just like we were. It was complete chaos. After three hours spent searching and waiting, finally, a nurse came and asked us to sit down. My heart sank. I listened as they told us how my mom was unconscious when she was loaded into the ambulance, that they tried to save her, but the damage was too severe for her to fight. She was dead upon arrival. She didn't even make it to the hospital. It hit me like a ton of bricks. My mom was just murdered. She was dead. I did not sleep at all that night. All I did was cry. I sobbed for the loss of my mother. I bawled for the pain of my children losing their grandmother. And I wept for the rest of my family as we had all just lost an absolute gem. Next picture, please. <clears throat> I still cry. Even as we approach one year without her, this year of all the firsts without my mom has been difficult to say the least. Every holiday, birthday, and monumental life moment, each of those moments, another reminder that she's not here. She was known for giving cards on every occasion and she showed up to everything she was invited to. She was always present because she genuinely cared. You could tell by the way her smile lit up the room or how contagious her laughter was. Her presence alone was just a sense of comfort, a feeling of home. She was supportive, encouraging, and just so laid back that you couldn't help but get along with her. These are just some of the reasons we all love and miss her so much. Next picture, please. Her name was Jane. Jane Kulik. Her sister called her pain, so she was anti-pain to my cousins <laughs> and known only as grandma to my kids. But for me, her name was mom. Mom and I were super tight. I could talk to her about anything in the world. We used to text each other almost every day, talk on the phone almost at least once a week and go out to lunch, just her and I, every other week. Every day, I'm missing those text messages. I miss hearing her voice on the phone and receiving her adorable voicemails or seeing her face light up when I unexpectedly pop up at the house. To simply say I miss my mom, is a dramatic understatement of my true feelings. I'm devastated, a bit lost, and I can't fully describe how it feels other than a piece of me is missing. My smile is not so bright. I don't laugh the same anymore because I'm just not the same. I have never experienced such a painful level of sadness for so many consecutive days. I have never felt this level of heartache for myself or for my kids. Even though we talk about it, I can only imagine how my kids have felt this past year. Not only are they coping with the loss of their own grandmother, but also they've had to watch me, their mom, grieve my mom. My oldest son is dreading his upcoming birthday, just like we all did this year as it's his first in 15 years without her. My mom always said they had a special bond and they really did. She had a unique bond with each of her grandkids as she did with each of us. 
My other son, Darius, was worried that he would forget his grandma's voice. And my daughter, Kylie, is finally able to talk about her grandma without tearing up. Each of my kids had a super close relationship with their grandma, and they're all missing her deeply. We were all so close. From family game nights, barbecues, Sunday drives, to family vacations and beyond, we really did a lot together. We've tried to continue all these things without her, but they're different now. As the kids say, it's just not right without grandma. Some things will never be the same without her. Everywhere we go, there seems to be exactly one empty chair that she should be seated in. A perfect amount of empty space in a family photo where she should be standing. Or a little moment of silence where she should be laughing or adding to the conversation. Empty space. That's what it feels like. Empty, broken, shattered. Our family has an empty space where one of our members belong. An irreplaceable person was taken away from us abruptly. A member of our family unexpectedly gone. The rest of us left with a broken heart, shattered by the murder of an incredible person, left with an empty space that only she could fill. You can go to the next one. At this time, I would like to address my mother's murderer. Whatever your name is, I don't care. You ran over my mom like she was mere roadkill. The only reason you hit the brakes that day was to get her off the hood of your car. You targeted her, you targeted her with your vehicle and you hit her on purpose. You don't deserve to be here. You do not deserve forgiveness. You somehow still get to talk to your mom but mine is gone forever because you killed her. It's astonishing to me that any person could have absolutely zero regard for their fellow human being. Since you call yourself a man of God, then you know that the only punishment you are deserving of is death six times over. And I can't wait for the day that I hear you're dead in prison. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Another one. Wow. Wow. My name is Alicia Kulik, and I am the youngest daughter of Jane Kulik. I've tried to figure out where to start, and there really isn't anywhere specific to start off with. I can't put all of my emotions onto however many pieces of paper because they're just not enough, at least in my mind. I've waited for this day, both anxiously, yet ready to share my piece on the matter. I'm here, uh, I'm here speaking upon behalf of my mother and the rest of my family and my twin brother standing right next to me. I've been to most of the trial that I could make it to, as it is my first year in college, and I, my mom would want me to put my schooling first. <sighs> I have many emotions on this subject, but without a doubt, the most, ex um, the most expense extensive emotion I feel is grief. At the time of this tragedy, I was 17 years old, and I was starting my senior year of high school, <laughs> which most people would think should be your best time of school. But for me, it was anything but that. I was starting my college journey, at least trying to. My mom managed to take my brother and I on at least two college tours before she had passed. It was my last prom, my 18th birthday, and of course graduating, all of which I did not enjoy. Not one of them. The joy of these things, were stripped away from me quickly on November 21st of 2021. 
I could tell you every last detail about that day, up to the clothes I was wearing. I could tell you what show I was watching, as I am thankful that I was sick that day and couldn't be at the parade to see what many got to see, unfortunately. I was bummed at first because I was sick that day and I couldn't see my mom march in her first ever parade. She was really excited. Granted, she's marched in parades before alongside my brother and I through WPRF, but this time the light was supposed to shine on just her. <laughs> um, I don't even think, I don't think that it had been two hours since she left that my dad got a phone call from someone my mom had been marching with stating that she had been hit by a car. At first, I thought my dad was just upset about something over work, because that's kind of common. <laughs> um, or what my mind went to was that maybe the after parade traffic was pretty bad and somebody just, she collided with another car, not a car to person. <sighs> I remember the first thing I did is my dad told us all to run and get our shoes. And before anybody got into the car, I called my best friend. And I told her that my mom had been hit and I didn't know the extent to which how bad the situation was and I would fill her in whenever I could. Ugh. On the way to the hospital was when reality quickly set in and oh how I wish I was right. I wish that it was just this, I just wish that it was a car on car crash. Not a car, not an SUV to person. As we got closer to the hospital, the drasticity of this incident was quickly revealed. Ambulances were surrounding the hospital and the waiting room was a triage. I will never forget the things I saw that day. I will never forget the chaos of parents searching for their children, demanding answers as we were for my mom. My dad rushed into the back. He had this sweatshirt on that had an ambulance symbol on it that he just thrifted and used it to his advantage. I specifically remember seeing the extreme dancers with gashes in their head and cuts all over their body and blood all over their clothes. In one direction, I saw one girl, probably no older than 10, seizing in her wheelchair and the mother just screaming, not knowing what to do for her precious child. In the other end, I saw a girl that was on a blanket on the floor she was screaming every time she was touched. And when we couldn't find out any information about where my mom was, I quickly knew, I quick, quickly my brain knew before my heart did the outcome. I never thanked my dad for this, but I appreciated the, optis, the optimism and the composure he kept during the longest waiting period of my life. He was optimistic, saying that God would make everything okay. And we'd even joke around a little bit about my, about my mom while she was, well, while she was dead. When a doctor finally approached us, I was in the bathroom. I had to take some time away from my family as I didn't want them to see I was upset. My older sister, she pulled me out and she told me that they finally had some information. And when they told us, when they brought us back to the room and told us to sit down, you just know, you just know. I had to prepare myself for what I was about to hear. Hearing that my mom had deathly injuries in her head and her lungs and all the rest of her organs and she was deceased. That is the words that he used. He was, de she was deceased. That is something that I will never be able to unhear along with what I saw in the triage of that hospital waiting room that day. Oftentimes when I hear sirens, I'm scared. I'm scared that another family has to go through what I went through, what my family went through. And it's terrifying that in the world we live in, something like that can happen in the blink of an eye. We were driven home by a squad that car that day, considering none of us were in good condition to drive. And I'll never forget all the phone calls I had to make to tell our loved ones that my mom was dead, that she didn't get the chance. She did not get a say in the matter. I remember calling my best friend 
all of my best friends. <laughs> and they stayed with me till three in the morning. And my boyfriend, they all did. And the next day I didn't even want to get out of bed. I couldn't. I don't, I, I still spend every day just waiting for this nightmare to end. As I think that second day, it still hasn't fully processed yet that my mom was no longer with us. <laughs> I never would wish on my worst enemy to have the burden to share such horrible news that nobody ever prepares you for. After all is said and done, I couldn't get out of bed for a few days, nor did I have much of an appetite. The next few days consisted of me trying to put together this new life all of which still doesn't, still doesn't sink in sometimes. But other days, believe me, it does. Even though I've received so much love and support from the community, my friends, and my family, I've never felt so alone. I don't think I'd ever be capable of feeling this much pain in my life, but here I am. I'm watching my siblings and my nephews and niece and my cousins and my aunt and all the rest of my family going through this is just terrible. <sighs> Up to today, I've experienced every holiday officially besides my oldest nephew's birthday without my mom. And they've all sucked, every last one of them. I slept through most of Thanksgiving. Christmas was probably the most depressing of all. It's supposed to be a time of cheer and joy, but how is it supposed to feel any of these things with my mom being dead? It was her favorite time of year, which made it even harder to enjoy. Every time we went to church, the song Silent Night came on, and she'd always cry. And now I do the same. I also had my 18th birthday, two months after she was murdered. If it wasn't for my sister planning an amazing party for both my brother and I, I don't think I would have gotten out of bed that day. She was the woman that brought me into this world and it didn't feel right celebrating without her. I had my senior prom without her and she didn't get the chance to tell me how beautiful I looked and then embarrass me with a bunch of pictures. I had to walk the stage at my high school graduation without my number one supporter cheering me on in the crowd. I received scholarships and my mom didn't get to tell me how proud of me she was. I spent most of my senior year in the guidance counselor's office, catching up on all the missing work that I had simply because I couldn't focus in class or at home because I was too sad. There was a classmate in my school that truly understood what I was going through besides my friend and family. The day after the parade incident happened, she called me and she asked if I was okay because she, her family had experienced what I had. Her little sister was part of the dance team and she was there and saw her sister get hit by this SUV. And as bad as it seems to say, I was glad in that moment that I had somebody that could relate to my situation that wasn't family. I felt for once that I had somebody that I could bond with that truly understood the emotions that I was feeling. I'm so glad that she didn't get to experience the extent of what I did and having to lose a loved one from the moment, but she came close. I love you guys. Quite often, I also think about my future as I think about my past memories with my mom. And although I wish I could say present memories, I don't have any. I think about how my mom won't be at my wedding and I'm gonna save a seat for her, but she won't be there and she won't get to see me say my vows or get married to the love of my life. And she won't ever get to see my future kids and they won't know what it's like to have a grandma that spoils them and how I have to be how I have to be the one with the burden to tell them of what happened to their grandmother and why they don't have one.
I won't ever get to ask my mom for parenting advice as a first time mom. You, Daryl Brooks, took these experiences away from both me and my brother, as he will be in the same position as I am. And I wish I could say that I don't carry anger in my heart, but that's just simply not true. I'm angry that all this could have been prevented if you had just stopped. I think about how my mom saw what was coming and she knew that there was absolutely nothing she could have done about it. I'm angry because as if my mom flying over the roof of your car wasn't good enough for you, you slammed on your brakes to get her off and continue to run her over. She wouldn't even have had a fighting chance because of you. I'm angry that all of us had to relive this trauma as you sat in that chair for weeks, not giving a single crap about any of these people. I've watched as you mocked the Bible and people's religion and the fake tears that you put on. I've watched as you gave your closing statement about asking the jury to do what they think is right when you couldn't have just done that yourself in the first place. I've waited for you to have a reason as to why you did all of this so that maybe somehow, somehow I could get the slightest bit of closure, but I never will. A lot of people have asked me how I feel about the verdict. I feel happy that he was found guilty on all counts. Well, the jury found him guilty on all counts. But, you know, it doesn't do crap for me because that won't change what happened to my mom. She will not be coming home ever again. She will not ever make me another dinner. She will not ever attend my wedding. And I'll never get to hear her voice or hug her again. So really, it changes nothing for me. <laughs> The only thing that it gives me at this time that I can say is that I know our justice system has persevered and that they have done my mom right. And I thank you all for that, as long with all the other victims. My life will never be the same because of you, Daryl Brooks. I have not enjoyed a single day fully since my mom has died. I'm depressed. A lot of the time, I don't watch certain shows anymore because it reminds me of my mom. I don't do certain things because it just hurts too much. I spent most of my summer inside instead of enjoying the sun and the warmth that we only get for a short period of time here in Wisconsin. I spent it inside being sad. You don't know what it's like. I had to be in that waiting room and my oldest nephew was texting me and asking me what is wrong and where his grandma was. And I couldn't lie to him. I had to say something. I was there when we had to break the news to my nephews and my niece that their grandma was not coming home. And I saw the tears run down their young, innocent faces and broke them. My nephew Darius, he's always been into video games. <laughs> But recently, all he does is stay in his room on the video games and he doesn't really come out much anymore and I can't help but think that's because of this incident, that he can't see my mom smile, that she was taking from all of us way too young. My mom was the glue that kept this family together and without her, we've been falling apart. We've been struggling to stick together because nothing's the same. And I blame you for that. Every piece of it. Thank you. Thank you. Again, powerful, every single one of them.
My name is Greg Houston. This is my wife, Carrie, family members of Jane Kulik. The definition of an angel is a person of exemplary conduct or virtue. They are tasked to keep the in all ways. Jane Kulik had many roles and relationships in her life, all of them purposeful and endearing. The impact in her many lifelong friendships were far reaching and will forever be felt. Jane had spent 52 years on this earth before she was ripped away from us by you on my daughter's birthday, which would have been a happy day. She was simply enjoying and celebrating the start of the season she loved best by handing out candy with her co-workers during the Christmas parade. That morning she went to church. She called her niece to wish her a happy birthday, planning to call her later in the day and spend time talking and relaxing with her family before getting ready to go for a pre-parade lunch and Packer game with the last people who would see her alive. <laughs> Jane considered those close to her as family. <clears throat> she had several families and roles within them. Some of them were daughter, sister, mother, wife, grandmother, aunt, and best friend. If you had gotten to know Jane, you would have known how seriously she took those roles and relationships. Her people were everything, and her biggest blessings and motivators were her children, Taylor, Jacob, and Alicia, husband John, her grandchildren, Robert, Darius, and Kylie. She was happiest when surrounded by all of them, planning trips, hearing about daily growing glows, having game night, and even just falling asleep while enjoying a movie together. The Benz Houston family was honored and blessed to spend 42 of those 52 years with Jane as our family. <coughs> there are too many memories to list that include her, memories that were both big and little life events. We would often hear stories of how her and her coworkers joked about her clumsiness, would be dressing up for the holidays, looked forward to and celebrate each other's milestones, or just plan to hang out. She was there for everything and for everyone. If she could not be there in person, she made up for it through weekly phone calls that would have you laughing yourself silly and creating a plan much like the one we had made the night before to go shopping, make cookies, just a fun holiday celebration. She was always willing and happy to help out, positive, never judgmental. Spreading grace and patience to all she encountered. She loved, honored, and held dear her people and their places in her life. Our places in her life were forced to change instantly on November 21st, 2021. Our places in her life became now the people that were responsible for helping to keep her family together and keep them strong, help her children and her grandchildren make it through everything. You changed our place in her life. You made it forefront and you made us helpless because we don't feel that we could do those things the way she could have. We feel inadequate and broken because of you. The evening of November 21st, 2021, everything changed. That evening, Alicia sent me a message saying, Auntie, Mom's been hit and we don't know where she is or where they took her. 
We immediately drove out there to find her and helped make several phone calls to area hospitals to find her. After several hours of not having any answers, we finally decided to go sit in the lot of Waukesha Memorial where her children and husband were trying to find out information and were under a lockdown. We couldn't even go hug them. After hours of not receiving confirmation, Taylor finally sent the hardest message I have ever had to read. She's dead. She's dead. My daughter collapsed to the ground and I turned to my husband and begged and cried for him to bring her back. I wanted her back. To tell you I know how we all moved and survived after that would be a lie. In the hours, days, and now a year following that night, we have all talked in the quiet hours when heartache, loneliness, nightmares, and anger set in about how much we miss her. For validation of our feelings and questioning of those same feelings, things we shouldn't have had to question. The question asked most by us is if Jane would have granted you grace. I know my answer. I know that she was the type of person that would have never saying anything bad about anyone. But for us, it's just not that simple, sir. This is what we do know, though, as Jane's collective whole. We will and never could ever forget her. We mourn the fact that she missed her twin senior year in graduation. We mourn the loss of her presence every day and especially at family functions. We miss the long weekly phone calls on Wednesdays and Fridays, reminiscing about old times, people we miss in just our daily lives. We miss her hugs, the smell of her hair, her trying to hold in a laugh when we would make faces at an inappropriate time. And as we say, we miss the 47 faces of Jane, much of which could be seen in the pictures taken just hours before her death. We are angry she will never be the mother of the bride or have the mother-son dance at her children's weddings. We are angry she will never get to make stronger bonds with the newest members of our family or hold the grandchildren and family yet to be born to her children or even ours. We are saddened that you feel you are suffering because your life has changed. For us, it changed the night you ripped her away from us and drove by with her body on top and slowed down and ran her over. You say you have a clear conscience. How can you suffer if you have a clear conscience? At least you will always still be able to make the phone calls, write the letters and visit with your people. We simply cannot, sir. Above all else, we are angry that Jane became known by people more because of the day she died and the way she died than because of who she was. Taking all of that into consideration, we ask that you please hand down the maximum sentence for each conviction that you possibly could. The definition of an angel is a person of exemplary conduct and virtue. They are tasked with keeping their people safe keeping them cherished, and keeping them loved. Those are all the things she did. So by that definition alone, Jane was an angel on earth. Thank you. Thank you. Those are the comments of group three, Your Honor. All right, then we'll take a 10 minute break and have you set up for the court. Thank you. All right, so that's three of the four groups. We've got one more going. I don't actually have a count on how many have actually spoken, but we're in the home stretch. Um, it's about three o'clock local time. I'm not sure how far, how long they plan on going. So we might just do the victim impact statements today, and then his people, whoever he does get, will be tomorrow. Um, 
suppose we'll see. I would describe myself as a fighter. I'm John Morgan of Morgan & Morgan. I fight the powerful. Yeah, if you notice, I don't exactly have YouTube yeah, premium either. But uh, yeah, it's a... Uh, these are powerful. I mean... Ah, oh, Lord. It's a, uh, yeah, don't get me started on Morgan and Morgan, right? I have things to, I have opinions about them that we don't necessarily want to go into. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that this has been cathartic for them. You know, I see some folks in the chat that are going through things and it's a little helpful. And so they understand. Um, but it is, it's a, these have been really powerful statements. And it's, uh, oh God, it's just, it's rough. It is. Um, but we're getting through it. We're almost done. I hope they push through to day two. Um, <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm happy to be there with you guys. Um, so, you know, we're getting through it together and we'll figure it out. Uh, yeah, that's basically what they're asking for. <clears throat> uh, I can't imagine. I think some of this actually, if I recall correctly, when I was looking at the statute, it's been a while, so don't quote me. Um, I think the homicides actually have to be concurrent. But I, I don't quote me on that. I'm not 100% certain. Um, but I think they want everything to be concurrent. So it's, you know, 1,100 years. And we just never hear about them again. Um, let's see. Uh, right now, the names of the people speaking. I think that's improbable. I would be concerned about letting him keep that paper. I don't necessarily know what their procedures are. I wouldn't want him to have it. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, I misspoke. Flip that. Um, but yeah, I think they want everything to be consecutive. And I think that's probably going to be the case. I, I can't imagine otherwise. And on top of that, somebody pointed out the judge is writing down notes about all of his behavior and his antics. So I imagine a very interesting sentencing statement when she finally throws this guy in jail forever. Um, I don't understand what that means. Yeah, like I said, I misspoke. Thank you, everyone. Yes, I misspoke. I get it. Thank you. It happens. I've been talking nonstop for like four or on this for like four hours. Oh, Knight, that's actually not a bad argument. He might argue that it's attorney work product potentially for his appeal. Oh, that's frightening. That's genuinely frightening, particularly if somebody in his sphere was the one that called in the bomb threat. Ugh. That's a really bad situation all around. Um, thank you, Kat, very much. I, you know, I would, I would like to say it's a pleasure to be here, it, but it's kind of miserable, but we're doing it all together. So that's what's important. Um, Thank you. You never know. The, the idea of having the witnesses against you available is a little, a little concerning, just generally speaking. And that, I don't like the idea. I would not like to have him with a copy of my name. Thank you, Sue. Welcome from Scotland. Um, 
Susie, so uh, this morning, I'd say about 11.20 a.m. my time, um, they had to clear the court for about an hour because somebody called in a threat to the courthouse. So they ended up shutting it down for about an hour. And sheriff came in, secured the building, everything was fine, and they resumed. But yeah, that's what happened this morning. Nothing ever goes normally on this case. That's what I'm realizing. That's kind of the fear. I, again, I would not particularly like him to have my name going back there, but you know, it's concerning. Um, let's see. I don't know what that means. Of course, I, I mean, I use language the way I see fit. One man's slur or one man's profanity is another man's lyric. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you very much. I'm glad to have you here. I'm glad for everybody who's here. I mean, this is a tough one, but it really is, it really is a... You know, we're getting through it together. And it's great to watch the chat and you guys interacting with each other and you know, talking through these things. It's I say it every time, but I have the best chat in the world by far. Okay, I didn't know which it was, but to some extent, it doesn't really matter which. Um, according to press conferences, they already have. So there's that. Yeah, you know, I'm going to turn off this background because it looks really awful while I'm full screen. So forgive me, guys, but we're going back to gray for a minute. Um, but yeah, uh, will they claim my illness? Yeah, according to press releases, that's already been their argument. Yeah, great excuse. I, I don't buy it. I think it's BS. I think everybody thinks it's BS. Suddenly mental illness is not having a goddamn soul, which I, yeah, go ahead and make your jokes. I walked into that one. Um... <laughs> yeah, I mean, in natural sunlight, I am actually blonde. I swear to you, but that's okay. The running joke's fine by me. Thank you. Um, all right, Tammy, I'll take a look at it afterward. Thank you. I will. I will take a look and I'll get back to you. All right, so, I mean, for lack of a better term, anyone have kind of a, a favorite person that went or something that they thought was particularly memorable that they want to bring back up? I mean, I thought the Marine was fantastic. Um, I thought... The old man in the in the dancing granny's sweater was absolutely heartbreaking. Um, but you know, it's a uh, the marine definitely. I think was probably Jackson Jackson's mom. She I, I don't know how she held it together as well as she did. She was so well composed, given that it was her child. That uh, just I couldn't even imagine being able to keep it together the way that she did. And they did make a comment uh, this morning that potentially people wouldn't be able to get through their statements. Um, and as a result, uh, they may have to um, what is it? basically go back and have somebody read it for them or complete it for them. Everybody's been really well composed. 
I, I was kind of surprised by that. But it, it's been, they've been really fantastic. And it hasn't been the same story over and over either. I mean, obviously there are common threads, but um, obviously there are common threads, but each of them comes at it with a different aspect. And I like the way that they broke it up to, you know, baseball team, band, dancing grannies. And I guess we have the Christian group last. Uh, I'm not 100% certain. Um, but that sort of thematic way of presenting it, I think, was very smart uh, by the prosecution. Because it does. It tells a story. It, it really it tells a story of different aspects of the community that were attacked that day. Yeah, the young girl, that was, that was rough. That was rough. Um, yeah, he was very good too. Oh boy. Yeah, that's, that's a brutal statement. And I mean, to some extent, I think statutorily, He's going away forever, regardless of this. But I think it's still important to do. Because even if it doesn't make an impact on him, like we've been saying, it can be cathartic for the families and the community to be able to say their piece and confront the person that took away their loved ones. I mean, the boss is coming home today. So, I mean, that, uh, I think that's important. I really do. So, thank you, Wolf Runner. Thank you for joining. Yeah, I definitely the Marine coming in hot. That was that was music to my ears after a really pretty sad set of stories for him to come in and finally express the anger that was bubbling in me, certainly. Oh yeah, baseball mullet guy was fantastic. He was really good. And he just so well written, well expressed. Uh, really, really good. No, the answer is no, Sparkle Star. I can answer that one for you. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know what? That goes to sh give a lot of credit to the victim impact group, which they've been thanking, you know, with the dog and everything, because they've been extremely well prepared. I mean, they've probably practiced this a dozen times. They've had plenty of people to kind of help them along the way and get ready for this. Um, so that says a lot about that service that they provide and everybody's been thanking them and I can absolutely see why. Oh. November 21st, 2021 is a day that will forever be etched in our minds and hearts as one of the worst days of our lives. On this day, you, Daryl Brooks, made the conscious decision to drive through the Waukesha Christmas Parade and destroy the sense of security and safety of my family and thousands of others. My two daughters were doing what they love most, dancing in the parade with their teammates, when you destroyed that fun. My oldest daughter watched as her teammates went flying through the air, one of which was her sister. She had to make the frantic call to me to tell me that her sister was injured. Not only that, but because you, Daryl Brooks, continued driving and didn't stop, no one knew if the danger was gone or if they were still at risk. I remember the terrified phone call from a couple of blocks away telling me to get inside the nearest building to stay safe. As a mother, I knew in that moment I couldn't leave my kids alone, so I had to make the choice to risk my own safety, run all the way down Main Street to get to them. I myself had to see the carnage of what you, Daryl Brooks, did to so many people. Those images will never leave me and will haunt me for the rest of my life. That view can only be described as that of a war scene, one which you knowingly caused. As we made our way down Main Street, I had no idea what to expect when I found my younger daughter. Mr. Brooks, you mentioned your young daughter during the trial. I want you to picture your daughter right now, your eight-year-old daughter, 
And I want you to imagine the fear and anger that you'd feel if a monster drove over your daughter and many others. I want you to picture finding your own daughter when I describe what I found. When I finally found our group, I had to run from person to person, lying on the ground to find my daughter. And when I finally did, she was unresponsive, couldn't open her eyes, was missing her white Christmas hat and headband and her shoe. Her sock was shredded with road rash on her foot. Her left leg was bent horribly in a way a leg shouldn't bend. Her head was immediately swelling in addition to the road rash across her face and the rest of her body and the blood coming from her mouth. It was over the next few days we learned of the extent of all of her injuries. Severe bleeding of the brain, which required emergency surgery, severe traumatic brain injury, multiple skull fractures, which required emergency surgery to repair, a severely broken femur, which required two surgeries to repair, a pelvic bone fracture, and I'm sure many others that I missed in the hundreds of pages of reports from her injuries and weeks long hospital stay. While my husband and I stayed in the hospital with our youngest daughter, unsure of whether she would live to see the next day, my family stepped up to take care of our older daughter and help her try to feel safe after the trauma that you had just inflicted. I cannot begin to expect a narcissist like you to understand what it's like to sit in the ICU staring at your daughter with tubes and wires from every part of her body trying to keep her alive, watching every monitor and test result, hoping that things are going the right direction, not knowing if your daughter is going to wake up the same bright bubbly girl she was before a monster plowed through at her Christmas parade. When she did wake up, the real struggle began. Our then nine-year-old daughter had to learn to eat, talk, move, and walk again. She had to use a wheelchair and walker for months, even as she returned to school. Instead of playing in the snow with her friends at recess, she sat in a wheelchair. She couldn't dance. She couldn't run around playing with her friends. Even today, she deals with the effects of this day. Her leg still hurts. She struggles with the neurological effects of her injuries, is on seizure medication, and worries about every little symptom for fear it is something bigger related to her injuries. Your own mother and grandmother, Daryl Brooks, have claimed your supposed mental health issues are to blame, but you, Daryl Brooks, were found to be completely competent and fully aware of exactly what you were doing. All you had to do was hit the brakes instead of the gas pedal. Yet like the narcissist you are, you claimed you honked to the horn, but in your eyes, somehow it was their fault. They didn't get out of the way. You were so fully aware of your wrongfulness of your actions that you ran from the vehicle, tried to change your appearance, and lied in an attempt to get away from the scene. You knew exactly what you were doing. Daryl Brooks, you have destroyed our sense of safety and security in our own community. You are the reason my kids are afraid to cross the street. You are the reason my kids don't sleep at night. You are the reason we may never enjoy a parade again. You are the reason my daughters are afraid of the dark. You are the reason my daughters don't feel safe without their parents around. You are the reason we visit doctors constantly. And you are the reason their lives will never be the same again. You have taken something from them that cannot be regained. And for that, I hope you rot in hell. Short, sweet, to the point. I like it. The Walk for Christmas Parade, November 21st, 2021, impacted me both physically and mentally because of you, Daryl Brooks. After the Christmas Parade incident that night, I had to try and find my sister. I was taken away from her to get to safety. I had to explain to my mom what happened while crying and trying to get to a safe spot. I got to finally find my family, but then getting taken away again from my mother and sister to get to safety. I had to try to stay calm in front of all of my cousins and family. I was not able to see my sister for over a week and a half, and I did not get to see my mom for several days. All of these things and many more were very hard for me. I was so worried, not just about my parents and my sister, but about all of my friends or family that were either at the parade or in it. After the parade, I was scared to go in my own house. I was even scared to be in a rumor house alone. It was very scary to do anything alone. I was scared of everything. I didn't sleep for the first night, even though you, Daryl Brooks, were arrested. I was so worried about that something might happen. I no longer felt safe. Not only did you impact me, but you also impacted my sister, Mackenzie. She was severely injured with a brain injury and a broken femur. She was in the hospital for two weeks because of you. I didn't get to spend as much time as I normally would with my parents because they were at the hospital mm -hmm. with my sister. During the holidays and Thanksgiving, I should have been able to spend with my parents and sister, but I couldn't because of you. The inc incident impacted me physically as well. I had a huge bruise on my back as well as the bruised bones in both of my ankles. 
That night, as soon as you drove through the parade, all I could think about was my sister. I was so worried about her. I kept trying to find her. After running from person to person, she was the last person that I found. All I remember was seeing my teammates' terrified faces as they were on the sidewalk. As I was looking for my sister, I saw four of the girls that were injured on the ground before I even found my sister. When I found her, I was suddenly rushed into a store, as I was still on the phone with my mom. As soon as I rushed into the store, my nana and uncle both came to get me when my mom went to the hospital with my sister. All I could remember is that I wasn't even scared for myself. I was mostly worried about my family and my teammates. It was almost three hours before we were allowed to leave the church we were on lockdown. I hadn't had any connection with my family for the whole time that I was in the church. There were a lot of people coming into the church after I came in trying to all stay safe. It's hard to even think that you do not even care about anything that you did or anyone that you hurt. It's hard to know that all you care about is trying to make everyone feel unsafe and scared to do anything. The fact that most scared me and made me feel disgust when I heard your name or saw you was the fact that you didn't stop when you hit multiple people. You didn't stop when you saw or heard yourself hitting people, and the most horrific thing is that all you try to do is run away from your problems. Let this be a lesson to you, Daryl Brooks. Your crimes and stupidity is always going to come back to you, no matter how hard you try for it not to. I hope you know that you were such a horrible person that night, and I hope you get what you deserve, and I know that you will. For the record, that would be from AA, Your Honor. Yeah. <laughs> has been all day it's just it's awful let me start off by saying i am one of four siblings that were victims of mr brooks in fact i am the oldest child and with being the oldest that comes with the unhealthy ambition to protect my family but that night on november 21st i felt like i was unable to achieve that goal my siblings fortunately don't remember that night, but unfortunately I do. I remember everything from celebrating my sister's birthday beforehand to meeting her unconscious at the hospital. I can't help but feel guilty for what happened to my brother that night, everything up to his open compound fracture and his shadowed humerus. Something deep inside me is still believes that it's my fault. He wasn't supposed to be there that night. He wasn't supposed to be walking in the parade, but he wanted to because his older sister was there. He was right next to me the whole parade up to when we got struck. <coughs> I can't help but feel like some of my mental and physical injuries or some of his mental physical injuries are my fault. I still remember screaming his name while being carried into burlap and lace on Main Street. I would like to say I had hope, but with all the frustrated, confused, and what-if <coughs> statements and scenarios in my head, that hope eventually turned into doubt. That night, I realized the love I had for my family. I still have regrets and struggles, but so does my mom, dad, friends, and community. We all have regrets, but the struggles we faced are laying on your hands, Mr. Brooks. My uncle always told me to show kindness through times of trial but I am not able to give that to you. Even through school, I've been taught that forgiveness is the moral way to forget, but I will never be able to forgive and forget. I mean, how can a man not know the difference between good and evil, right and wrong, good and bad, basic things you were taught in kindergarten? Brooks, your behavior before and during this trial, your ignorance and arrogance to the victims of your crime is so disrespectful and just unbelievable. Fun fact, you, Mr. Brooks, brought my mom to testify on your behalf. How could you believe that was the civil thing to do, knowing that she had four kids injured and hit by your SUV? You knew that this would affect her and my family emotionally and physically. How could you be so stupid, egotistical, and delusional? You bring up mental illness, but what I find unacceptable is the fact that you had the choice, but you kept going. I will always have the simple question of why, but that might never be answered. My sisters had a passion for dance. My brother played baseball and soccer. I am a dancer and I will always be a dancer, but because of your actions, it will never feel the same. I know my siblings and I have accepted the fact that we 
might never be able to regain our passions and dreams. We know that we now have lifelong challenges, but we also have people that support us and help us regain our hope and goals that we lost that night. Overall, I want people to remember that this is not about the parade, this is about the man. The depression, anger, sorrow, all these negative feelings shouldn't be directed towards the parade, instead directed towards the man. This is not the parade's fault, and I think we need to come together as a community and realize that. With all the media and all the press, reaching out to my family in the past year has brought anxiety and stress. But I want that, oh, I want to thank my family, friends, and community one more time for supporting my family through these trying times and also giving me the confidence to stand here and say I want to punch this man in the face. Your Honor, I need Daryl Brooks to serve the time he deserves without parole. I need him to be locked up for life, and that is my statement. Oh my God, he just got thrown through a wood chipper by a miner. Go girl, that's awesome. Mr. Daryl Brooks, I am back. Do I have to say more? My daughter pretty much clarified why the hell did you bring me up to the stand? Pardon my language, Judge. Absolutely boggles my mind. Absolutely boggles my mind. Once, twice, three, four, five times, they brought my children's names up. They addressed concerns. I just, your arrogance and your behavior is just pathetic. On that behalf though, I am here on behalf of not one, not two, not three, but four children. I'm not gonna testify and tell you all the particulars and injuries of what happened to my children. We saw that on the stand. I'm not gonna tell you about the stress of how as parents, we had to suffer and continue to suffer day after day, taking our kids to appointments, having a healthy mind and soul. But you know what? We're doing a darn good job. I say this with a heavy heart. I have my kids here. I have my kids here. Grayson, as Charlotte says, had open compound fracture. We know how open compound fracture happens, Mr. Brooks. You could have stopped. You saw the darn exhibit. Oh, sorry. We, you saw that exhibit of my daughter. You saw her. And your expression is unacceptable. Your behavior has been unacceptable. Emotionally as a mother, you have to go one way or another. You have to, let me just start off by saying, as Charlotte knows, there were two calls that came to me that night and I couldn't, I couldn't put everything together. I was just like, what is going on? That third call, my mindset changed. I couldn't cry. I couldn't get mad. I couldn't, I had to fight for my children. Their father and I had to push forward. Do we have time to worry about our own feelings? Oh boy. <laughs> we still are working through that. I am working through that. But you know what? I won't show them weakness. They are on a positive road mentally and physically. My son Grayson loves soccer, can kick that ball in any direction. And now he's still learning to walk and run in a consistent manner. Alice, as Charlotte mentioned, whose passion was dancing, has sorrow now. She hasn't been, she hasn't made it back to dancing yet. 
Vivian, the youngest, as you saw in that exhibit, as I spoke, is the life of the family, joking, living it up when you broke her tailbone and she was unconscious at Children's Hospital for extended time. You did that, Mr. Brooks. This is on you, but these kids will not be weak. Their family will not allow them to be weak. They are gonna strive for success with what you put them through. Again, I, I want to limit any like injury, things of that nature, because you know what? They're striving, they're doing great. And I can only hope that they continue in that manner in a positive nature. What I do want to thank is a few people, Jeff, who helped Charlotte that night, um, both Officer Ryan with Waukesha, I'm using their first names, Officer Ryan, who did save Grayson's life, Officer Ryan from Pewaukee, who did drive um, Grayson to the hospital. The other fellow dance families who have slowly and surely advised me of their personal connections they had with my four kids that night that I can't be thankful or sorry, I can't, I'm going to be forever grateful there for their love and compassion for their grandparents who had to watch our two other children while two of them were in children's hospital for extended time. And for my sisters who were my heart and soul during this whole time, helping my family move forward, trying to figure out how we move forward with four children being injured. I do have in closing, as I mentioned earlier, I do say with a heavy heart, my hands are shaking, sorry. I do have a heavy heart because I do have my children with me, but as Charlotte has said, um, my brother, who unfortunately passed away two months before this event took place, always told us kindness will take you far. So to those who unfortunately are not with us, I just would like to read the following. I watch you every day. I am always very near. I know deep down in your heart, you realize that I am here. I hear you when you speak to me, when you are on your own. You cannot understand the reason, the reason that I am gone. I will never leave you. I am here to keep you strong. Talk to me, I hear you. We share an unbroken bond that will always be. Death won't keep us apart for our love is forever. Just remember me in your heart and one day we will be together. Live your life and live it full. Don't waste a single day. Remember, I am always with you every step of the way. And as it has been said before, we do have angels looking over us. And my children now have six more. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. I have struggled to write down words to describe the impact November 21st of 2021 has had on me. What was supposed to be a joyful day was quickly turned into an unimaginable nightmare. I woke up that morning excited for the parade instead of dreading it like I always do. Out of all the workshop parades I've walked in the past four years, this was the only one I looked forward to. If only I knew it was going to be the worst day of my life. As the parade started, I went around taking pictures of all the girls while they danced. So their parents had action shots of them dancing. We rounded the corner of White Rock and finally made it onto Main Street. I remember seeing the beautiful sunset behind my girls. I recorded them dancing with the sunset behind them, little to know that would be my last video of them. My video was taken 10 minutes before 
exactly 10 minutes before the defendant senselessly drove his car straight into my girl's backs. They didn't even have the chance to move out of the way before he plowed into them and continued on his path of destruction. Alice was the first body I saw and picked her up immediately and was quickly yelled at to put her down, not knowing it could have just caused more damage to her. She was awake and conscious. I took off my coat to give her a pillow and laid over her body to shield her. I kept telling her she was going to be okay. One thing that will stick with me forever is the fact that she looked up at me with her teeth chipped and knocked out and said, why would someone do this? I will never forget those words. The defendant was 39 at the time. She was 10. If a 10 year old knew it was wrong, so did he, but he didn't care because he kept driving. <laughs> he is the definition of a monster. After Alice, I was with two more of my girls in the street before waking, making my way to the hospital. The hospital was also another chaotic scene. Bodies all over. People were standing, sitting, and laying in the ground. I saw one of my girls laying on the floor with her mom. I held her hand and kept asking her to squeeze me so I knew she'd stay with us. She kept going in and out of consciousness. Every time she'd open her eyes, her mouth would open as she sobbed in absolute pain. I glanced to my left and saw another one of my girls in a wheelchair with about five nurses huddled around her. She wasn't doing good and they knew that. We rushed her to the back as she started to seize and vomit. When her parents arrived, I left the hospital not knowing if I'd ever see some of my girls alive again. The following days, Weeks and months were just as horrible. Four of my girls were in comas. The questions never stopped circulating in my head. Would they ever wake up? Would they even remember who I was? The thing about being a coach is you're kind of stuck in between being a mom and a friend. I felt trapped that I couldn't take their pain away. Trapped that I couldn't be there with them at the hospital every day. I had to put a brave face on for all of my other girls, even though I was completely broken inside. Attempting to describe the impact this evil crime has had on me would be impossible. How can I write into words something that broke me so badly? Emotionally and mentally, I have never been the same since that day. Throughout the whole trial, I waited for the defendant to cry for him to show some sort of remorse, remorse for my girls and everyone else he hurt. He has shown no sense of empathy other than for himself. Only a monster would show no remorse for such a heinous crime they committed. He knew exactly what he was doing and he just kept driving. He knew it was wrong because he then attempted to flee after he ditched the car. He's a selfish and cowardly human being who deserves to never see the daylight again. Thank you. Remember, uh, from the trial your honor, that was only to be My name is Dylan Urell. I'll read their symbols that I was given I I J J K K L L. But their names are Charlotte, Alice, Vivian, and Grayson. I'm not a victim. It's very hard for me to stand up here and to be talking about a victim when I don't feel like a victim. My children are the victims. Other people were victims. I'm a beholder. And I feel I'm a beholder of the darkness and the evil, but also the light and the good of the aftermath of the act of the violence that Mr. Brooks brought upon the community that evening. Let's talk about this is a Christmas parade, a Christmas parade that I have attended many times. Uh, my oldest daughter, Charlotte, has been a part of the extreme dance for many years. She was there handing out candy along with my son. At that time, I did not know that he was handing out candy. 
but I knew that my two other daughters were a part of the teams. They're part of the junior team and the mini team. I sometimes walk into the parade. I do not like walking in the July 4th parade because it's too hot. Okay, I'd rather walk during the Christmas parade when it's a little bit cooler out. But at that time, I texted my mom and said, would you like to come? I was not supposed to be at the parade. I was supposed to be up north hunting that weekend. So I decided to stay back. Decisions that I reflect upon and think about how I became on that spot uh, off of Wisconsin Avenue or, uh, on that day. So my mom texted me and said, yes, I will come meet you. So I was not, and if she did not do that, I was going to text my oldest daughter, Charlotte, and say, I'm going to meet you in the staging area, and I will come walk with you and hand out candy. So I was standing on Wisconsin with my mom, and to say, now about this parade, now this is about children. The Christmas parade is about children, about happiness and love. That evening, if people remember, was very cold and windy, very bitter wind, where sometimes that wind gets you and you're almost just standing there. But even through that coldness and the bitter wind, you can really truly feel the happiness within the crowd of the parade. And I thought about that. And it's just about, I knew that possibly around the corner, standing over on, on Wisconsin, that eventually the extreme team would be coming around that corner and, and, I, and I'd see them. And then I had my hood up. And it's, it's cold, but then at the corner of my eye and kind of watching it, I see a red SUV start to come around that corner, but not really fast, not very fast because Mr. Brooks, you hit the brakes to go around the corner. If you did not hit the brakes, you wouldn't taken that turn way too fast. And then you would have gone into the veterans park. So that part, it didn't seem too odd to me. My hood was kind of covering. I didn't really see the damage of the SUV. So I saw the SUV turn it, but I didn't think it was odd until it did not turn and crashed through the barriers. And then the officer shot three times after it. Silence. The parade now, everyone is silent. Northwest Avenue, I live on that road. Two blocks up. That is my road that I live in. Silence. But then... People start kind of moving. Where it's like the parade just stopped. I moved to this, uh, moved to the corner, and then you start seeing and feeling the people starting to stream around the corner, screaming, crying. I have my mom with me. They're saying, "Do not go around that corner. There are dead people. Do not go around that corner." We both looked at each other, and I said, "Where are the children?" So me and my mom went around that corner. And really went through the wake of the evil and hell that Mr. Brooks, that you brought to this community. And going through and seeing and going around the corner and seeing just bodies as far as you can see injured on the ground. And sometimes I feel personal guilt that I couldn't truly stop and help some of those people in need. I had to keep going. At time, I paused and paused. I have my mom screaming, crying, seeing women, adults, people injured, deceit bodies. Once we pass through that section, that's where, Mr. Brooks, you changed me. Because at that point, there's a difference where they talk about an active shooter. Not everyone saw the officer shoot. So in that case, they didn't know. There's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot of just in that all the realm. People are screaming. People are crying. There's people running all over the place. That's where you changed me, Mr. Brooks. That's where I, after a thing, I gave myself up to say, if there's an active shooter, I am willing to get shot in my head. I am running up the street. Where are my kids? And that's what I did. And as the darkness descended upon that street, as the sun was going down, and I run up the middle of the street, and I run up to the five points, I start seeing the extreme truck that they use, pom-poms on the ground, but you can't see around there, around. And then I come around. I left my mom, which was a decision that I had to make. She caught up, but I took off running. I found my daughter... Alice first, and it was mentioned, she had broken teeth, 
blood on her face, face on. She's so brave. When I came to her, I screamed her name two to three times. There were people around her trying to help her. She looks at me and she goes, Daddy, I'm okay. I'm okay. And I didn't know what to. And she looked at me and I, I just, at that point, I didn't understand. And she goes, and I go, where's Vivian? She's over there. And I look around and there's my youngest daughter over by the side of the curb, motionless. Her limbs weren't moving, but yet her body was shaking uncontrollably. So I went over there to help there. And from my daughter, Alice, I learned that my son, for the first time handing out candy, was in the parade. I did not know that. I was also told by her that Charlotte, my oldest, was, was there and was, she was injured. <clears throat> you did this. They weren't the only ones, the children. This, this is a Christmas parade about love and happiness, getting ready for the holiday season. I'm sitting in the other room watching other statements and watching you roll your eyes to people's powerful statements. The hurt that people have in their souls. And you're rolling your eyes at them and making facial expressions. If I look around this room, no one else is wearing a mask. What are you hiding from? You're wearing a mask. I don't see anybody else. Forgiveness. I do not forgive you. I do not forgive you because I have not heard these three words from you through this entire trial. I am sorry. Not once. Not once have I ever heard anything. What I've heard you do is be abusive. Abusive to the judge. Abusive to the prosecution. Abusive to the witnesses. And I think that's what you have. You're an abuser. And then when people stick up to you, do you want to become? Now you're the victim. You carry your Bible, and you say you're a God-fearing man. But I feel those scriptures are hollow and empty to you now. Just like God has left you. You can pat your chest and have that book open, but I don't believe those, those words and those scriptures mean anything to you anymore. My children are healing, and the community is healing. If there is no verses between me, between my children and the other people that hurt, the people that lost their lives and their families. But we're all in this together now. Every, all of us, the community, it isn't just people that live in Waukesha. What you did had these, these energy that went across, it goes so far for the people that you hurt. And I don't think you truly understand that, or maybe you don't care. For the sensing, as other people have said, I feel the maximum is appropriate in this situation. The terror, the horror, the pain, the fear that you've caused to so many individuals. And everyone has their own unique path for healing. And I hope that you will get sentenced to what you deserve. Thank you. Thank you. The way that started, I wasn't sure, but damn if you didn't bring that together. That was great. <clears throat> Honestly, um, I have so much to say to you, Daryl, um, and to the court. Um, you exemplified Christ, and you were going to be very blessed and honored for that. So thank you. Okay. You guys were amazing. Honestly. So thank you. Um, my daughter was not listed as a victim. Um, she was dancing with Extreme Dance Team on November 21st um, with my niece. Um, she was on the right side of the route um, and did not get hit. Um, but she did get, she did not get hit by the car. She got hit by another team member. And that wasn't revealed to me, Daryl, until I watched the video. And I I struggled to understand how my daughter got injured. And I'll get more into that, but that day you impacted thousands. And I know this is just another story for you. 
and I wish it would impact you. And I really pray that it does, okay? So as the parade started, we were by the library. I dropped my daughter off in her position with her team. And I just remember when the parade had stopped and I knew immediately. My sister-in-law got a phone call from my niece. And my niece, who's 13 at the time, said my whole team is dead. Our girls were living in fear thinking their teammates were dead, Daryl. They thought they were dead. The images that they saw of their friends will never be erased. <clears throat> we got the phone call and I did not see you hit anybody. When I hit the main street, I saw the dancing grannies dying. I didn't know who they were until the names were released and I had to figure out in my own head who I saw dying. One of the moms who's an ICU doctor was working on one of the dancing grannies. There was blood everywhere, Daryl. You have to see what you did. I had no idea what I was walking into. And I honestly, I'm so sorry for all the families who lost their loved ones. Um, what I saw, no human being should ever see. Everyone that was in the court witnessed what you did, but I, I lived it, I walked it. Heard things I didn't want to hear. Um, I heard someone screaming over Jane Kulik. Um, and I no longer could remember anything after that, after I saw Jean dying, until I got to my daughter. We were ushered into the bakery, and I screamed for my daughter. She was safe. But I have survivor's guilt over the, her living, and that's not fair. Six people died. There's a mom who doesn't have her baby boy anymore, and I got to go home with her that night. Once we were released from the bakery, we had to walk back through the nightmare. It was a crime scene. There were bodies covered up that my daughter had to see a dead person covered up because it was a crime scene. The next day, my daughter woke up and screaming in pain. They didn't take her to the hospital. Um, I did what I thought was best to take her to the chiropractor and get her x-rays. It's just, I'm a naturopath, so that's what I do. Her doctor has never seen such a twisted spine, neck, pelvis. We had to put her back together. She was, but emotionally she was broken. She had nightmares. She missed school weekly. And it's because of another little girl who hit her from the car that you hit. And I figured that out a few weeks ago. I didn't know what happened. Daryl, I don't know what's in your heart. I don't. But also God tells us that we will know them by their fruit. I'm a Christian. I believe in the Bible. I believe in any everything that the Bible has to say. I'm not perfect either. But what we witnessed during the trial was you reading or holding your Bible, even in anger, saying that you were reading the book to the judge. What is hard to witness is that reading that Bible has not brought you to repentance. When I read that Bible, the things that I've done, I am repentant and I say sorry for what I've done. I'm not perfect. So when the word of God convicts us by reading the word, it produces change. I have not seen that in you. Not once have you repented to even ask for forgiveness for what you've done. Not once have you admitted what you've done. Can you not face what you've done? You have to. You have to face what you've done. You presented to the court that you didn't want to be called by your name. This is a trial that you caused. The DA didn't cause this trial. My daughter and her team didn't cause this trial. The state of Wisconsin and all parties involved didn't cause this trial. You did. You have to own that. To me, this is not a man who's after God's heart. You used the Bible and you used God. That's blasphemy. I know what I'm talking about. 
This is not a mental, matter of mental health or a system failing you. You failed yourself. If you are a man like you say you are and you were not brought up this way and you were brought up in a Christian home, go back to your Christian roots. Go back to the man that God actually wanted you to be. But in turn, you have, no, you have not had any responsibility to confess of what you did that day. You can't face that you murdered people. You've injured hundreds. You emotionally traumatized thousands. And not repent from what you did. To repent means that you, and to be saved means you get to enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay? You have to ask for forgiveness. You have to admit what you did. This is not going to change bringing people back. It's not going to change the 21st. It's not going to change people's lives. But you might actually help someone heal just by saying, I'm sorry. You also said in your closing statement that this was God's will for what you did that day. And that I believe is a false testimony of the God that I know. You are a father. And my, my daddy, my heavenly father would never ever want anyone to be murdered with a car as the murder weapon. All those you hurt and killed they, that day, they're his children. Doesn't matter what age they were. <sighs> John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins, to cleanse us from unrighteousness. That includes you, Daryl. You must confess to all these people in God so that you can be saved. And that's not popular for you to enter the kingdom of heaven. It is possible. The man hanging on the cross, like the earlier statement, he was saved that day and the other one wasn't. And that I want you to sit with. For the wages of sin is death. That means hell. That means hell. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. So I'm angry for what you did. I'm sad that a lot of people don't get to spend another day with their loved ones. I'm sad that a lot of my dance family, we don't know. I mean, we don't know the outcome of their brain injuries and what's their future. You've to traumatize families and people that have witnessed you, thousands. You killed six people. But maybe, just maybe you could bring some peace to some of these people. Do you hear me, Daryl? Instead of rolling your eyes that what you did, disrespected, and I know people yelled at you today, but I'm not coming to you in anger. I'm coming to you in unconditional love because that's what our Father offers us. I don't know if I have forgiven you yet, and I know that's what God wants me to do, but I think that you could just offer a little peace by just saying, I'm sorry. Thank you. November 21st will never be the same. It was a very tragic day for us all. With this day being the day after my birthday, November 20th, I was thinking it would be a good day. I was going to be dancing in the parade with Waukesha Extreme Dance Team. I loved this team as a home. My mom, dad, aunt, and cousin were sitting at the end of the parade route. As we got closer to the parade starting, I got a really uneasy feeling in my stomach. As me being a Christian, I believed it was the Holy Spirit warning me. My cousin was also on the team with me. <laughs> in the parade, she was in front of me and we were both on the far right side. As we danced in the parade, I knew something was wrong. Something just didn't sit right with me. After this feeling, my hearing went out. All I heard was loud thump noises. My friends getting hit by the SUV. I had seen two girls fly across the concrete and hit the curb in front of me. I got out of the way, confused and in shock. I remembered I had left my phone in the car. I saw my cousin Brooklyn get her phone out and call her mom. As a 13-year-old, the words she spoke on the phone are words I would never want to hear someone I cared so deeply for say. As her mom answered the phone, not knowing what had happened, Brooklyn spoke and said, Mom, my whole team is dead. People then told us there was a shooting and we needed to take it to safety, so we in went inside of a bakery. They told us all to go into the back of the bakery for safety. I called my mother off of somebody's phone and told her to get inside and be safe. 
but she told me no, she was going to find me. I told her the building name I was in. I sat there drowning in my thoughts until my mom had got there. As she entered, I heard her screaming my name. She hugged me, and a few seconds later, somebody screamed that there was an active shooter, so we all dropped to the ground. I moved to the corner where Brooklyn, my aunt, and other friends were sitting. It felt like we were sitting there for hours when it wasn't that long. As we sat there, my best friend, my cousin, was saying something that would haunt me forever. She sat there with her head tucked in her knees, repeating over and over and over again to herself how she thought she was going to die. I thought my best friends had died that day, and this thought will forever be with me. We eventually got let out to walk back to our cars. As we were walking out, I saw one of my best friends laying on the ground of the bakery. She had not been taken to the hospital yet. I stayed calm that whole time up until I saw her. As I walked back to my car, Link, Link armed with my friend. We tried to look at our feet and not up at the street, but I couldn't help looking up. I'd seen bodies covered up in the streets. That image will never leave my mind. I woke up the next day not being able to move my body. I screamed and cried thinking I was paralyzed. We didn't go to the hospital, but to the chiropractor. I got x-rays done and they came back showing the worst whiplash my chiropractor has ever seen. My spine was thrown off and twisted in ways it should not have been. It was so bad my spine could barely support holding up my head. It was the worst pain I've ever felt. My mom asked me if I'd got hit by the car, but I told her I couldn't remember. For the last year, I've been recovering still. Many days, I'd feel pain unimaginable. I also had got horrible migraines a lot. Many days, my whole arm would go numb from the injury. Some days, I couldn't feel any of my left side. These days were some of the scariest. We couldn't figure out how I got injured until a video was released. It showed how a girl that had got hit flew into me, injuring me. Not only did this day change my, my, my life physically, but mentally too. I struggled with depression afterwards. I blamed myself for this awful tragedy. I told myself there was some way I could have stopped it from happening, even though it was something I had no control over. My mental health declined majorly. I tried my best to act okay so people wouldn't worry, but many days I just couldn't. I skipped school so many days weekly because I couldn't mentally go. I was in so much darkness, I couldn't find any light. I tried my best asking for help, but I was too scared. I thought about you every single day, Daryl. I thought, how could any man do this to any other human being? I'm sorry to all those who lost people and they'll never get to see again. It angered me every day. It hurt to think about. This day will always and forever have a place in my mind. The days after we waited to find out info about my friends. <laughs> Some of them had horrible brain injuries and other horrible physical injuries. <laughs> At one moment, I was told my friend Julia would maybe not make it. <laughs> it broke me hearing that. <laughs> Knowing I cared about all these people so much, it hurt me to know they were in a situation like this. <laughs> As I continue to try to heal, I realize it takes a long time to heal physically and mentally. I didn't think my mental health would ever get better. I thought this up until I surrendered my life to Jesus. I leaned on him for help. A verse that stuck with me is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. This verse reminded me that I can get through this and will get through this with the help of God. I knew if I could that my friends could as well. As I wrote this here, I finally realized this all truly happened to me. I guess I never really allowed myself to believe it because I never wanted to. But we must all face things in our lives. As I watched the trial go on, you always had your Bible, but you never repented. You never asked for forgiveness for ruining people's lives. John 16, 13 states, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will declare the things unto you that are to come. And as you sat there with your Bible, all you had to do was declare what was true, to confess what you had done, when you knew you had done it and you knew it was wrong. 
But you sat there, you rolled your eyes, not caring that you killed innocent people. <laughs> so I'm so horribly sorry to all that had lost, to all people who had lost things that day. Loss of friends and family members, loss of being able to be the same person ever again. I'm sorry to all who struggle with health problems for the rest of their lives. I know that I lost a piece of myself that day, and I'm still trying to find it. This day was supposed to be a happy day filled with smiles and laughter, but it had got turned into a tragedy. This day will never be the same for any of us. Uh, that one's Dear hard. Judge Daro, my name is Yuretsi Becerra Montes. On November 21st, 2021, my life changed, my life and my family's life changed forever. The day that was supposed to be a day of joy that became a nightmare to me, my family, and our community. On that day, my parents and my siblings witnessed the red SUV that drove into my dance team. My mom, my mom ran without thinking she could be hurt too. She remembers the red SUV that almost hit her while, she, while running into the road because he was coming her way, but he swerved. They couldn't find me right away because I was under a car that was playing music, playing the music for us. I flew 15 to 20 feet from where I was dancing. I was lucky that I wasn't injured like my friends because my head bumped into a truck that was playing the music for us and I fell on the street and hit the back of my head on someone's leg, but I didn't suffer from a major injury. <laughs> my family calls me a miracle because things would have been worse and maybe things would look would look different if my injuries were more severe. I spent a couple of nights in the hospital, but the worst part was that I woke up and asked my dad what I was doing in the hospital because I was dancing and I thought my nightmare was over. It was a trauma it was a traumatic experience that traumatized all of us. While I was in the hospital, I I was remembering what really happened. I was dancing that day and I had a smile on my face. And they hurt what I thought were fireworks. It were good jobs. <laughs> but at the moment, I knew that nothing happens in Waukesha and that I'm safe. And so I kept dancing. I was hurt that day. I was struck by the red SUV. I felt like I was going to die. <laughs> I woke up on the ground to my family surrounding me, thinking it was all a dream, not knowing what was going on. My body was hurting and I couldn't move. I saw the looks on their faces. My mom was crying and so was the rest of my family. My mom kept telling me the paramedics to go help Go help others, other people that were unconscious. My daughter is awake and is talking to us. Please go help other people, others. My mom was a hero. She helped a little girl that was hurt in the middle of the road that was being stepped on. And she carried her and put her on the side of the street and asked people to help her because she was still looking for me. I remember someone holding my hand in my head, telling me it was going to be okay. Then I heard someone yell, active shooter. Scared and shocked at the disbelief of what was going on, my dad had to carry me to a bakery for our safety. All I could hear were ambulance sirens and screaming. I couldn't understand what was happening because there was so much going on. 
I wasn't sure if it was real life or a dream. But at the moment, I was really hoping it was a dream because I didn't want it to be real. I had to witness everything around me and my friends on the ground unconscious, not knowing what would happen to them and if they would even wake up. Since that day, I've been traumatized with sirens, screaming, fireworks, being in big crowds, and hearing the song I danced to when the tragedy hit. After that day, it was a very hard topic to talk about, as well as now. To this day, I still struggle with pain and nightmares and PTSD. I don't know when my body is going to feel normal again. All of this made me sad, angry, and anxious, because I cannot understand why someone could do this to our community. All of Waukesha had experienced this tragedy, even if they weren't there to see it. As in losing loved ones, having to go through an injury, or families that were injured as well. People who watched it happen and see their loved ones get hurt, or even just seeing this tragedy on the news. This affected our community of Waukesha to the point that some people weren't and still aren't ready to go back downtown, or even participate in a parade again. I'll always struggle from that day and it haunts me and so many others to think that a tradition for over 50 years has become a remembrance of the people who died and the injuries that occurred that day. I forgive him after everything he's done even though he never apologized for his actions because I'm thankful justice has been served and that he won't do damage to anyone again. I thank you, Your Honor, and everyone in the jury for making justice for all of us and our community. I ask you, Your Honor, that he won't ever see the light of day again. I thank you for everyone who supports us through difficult times. Thank you. This last set, man, has been really brutal. That's what I'm gathering from the chat. What What is the last group? All the children. Uh, address the picture that would be putting will be putting up on the easel. Yeah, the children In that picture, survivors. It is my sister, Jessalyn Torres, victim HH in the ICU. It is what a lot of other victims have looked like from tubes keeping them alive to machines being watched over every minute of the day to see if they're doing okay. November 21st was like any other Christmas parade. My sister was dancing, my mom was pulling my baby sister in a wagon, and my brother and I were walking with them throwing candy. Everything was so normal in the beginning. Everyone was lined up in their ordered orders and people were taking pictures, laughing, talking, dancing. The mood was very joyful and then all of a sudden it wasn't. The images and events from that day still weigh heavily on my mind. Vivian Urell was the little girl I stayed with for a little bit after the tra tragic event. I, I still can feel the blood on my hands after I wiped it off her dripping head with my cold fingers. I told her that I was there for her so that she knows that somebody was with her as I listened to her whimpering cry that stays in my mind. <laughs> I cried when I found my baby sister without my mother. She was confused about what just happened, so I held her in my arms, squeezing her as tight as I could. I remember finding my mother and sister, the visions of my mother's face in a panic, trying to puzzle everything together. She had her hands over my sister's body, along with others, holding my sister's head. I screamed when I saw the sight of my sister. 
<laughs> her face looked destroyed with her body half naked from her clothes getting ripped off. <laughs> I still remember my other family members' faces and screams when I, they saw my sister lying there. I broke down and fell to my knees. I felt broken when my grandmother started breaking down and screaming. <laughs> The moment when they lifted my sister's unconscious body with a blanket into the back of the sheriff's car made me suddenly not breathe. It felt like there was no more air left in the world. It felt like I was being stabbed in the heart when I read my mother's messages about all the injuries my sister had. It was one text of her after another. I couldn't believe it was all real. From the trauma, I couldn't go back home because I knew my mom or sister wasn't going to be there. So I went to my friends, and my friend helped me that night as my body shook. The pain of not being able to see my mother and hearing the cries of my two-year-old sister constantly saying that she wants her mom broke my heart into little pieces. The whole time my sister was in the hospital, it was a blur, a tunnel vision every day, hour, minute, and second. We were lucky to have a Thanksgiving miracle to be able to see my mother for the first time after the incident. It relieved some of my pain and anxiety and it felt nice to have so much weight removed off my chest when I hugged my mother, even with it being a short visit at Children's Hospital. My family had so much support from friends, other family in the community. Even though we had so much support, I felt like I was alone. I should have been getting the support from my own mother, but she couldn't leave my sister's side at the hospital. I felt forgotten. I was trying to give my other siblings support when I thought, oh, I'm sorry, when I thought like I didn't have anyone to support me. I felt selfish, even though I shouldn't have. Chlorine in class every day. I didn't want to be anywhere but home, wishing that my mom and sister were with me. Not being able to physically move from the hurt that I felt. I felt drained. My mental health was declining so much. I lost interest in the people and things I love so dearly. I was miserable. Finally, two weeks later, getting the call that my sister was awake felt like my heart got back to normal again. I showed everyone pictures with pure joy on my face that my sister was awake. <sighs> Two days before Christmas, they came back home. Everything was going okay until one night my sister felt like she suddenly couldn't breathe. My mother rushed her back up to the hospital. They found out later she had built up scar tissue in her trachea from being on the ventilator for so long and getting so immune to the drugs that she was on. She would wake up and move around in a panic. My sister has a, has had around 15 surgeries on her trachea since. One day my mom was looking on the scab on the back of my sister's head. <laughs> And when I saw everything from the parade came back to my mind, the images of that day happening over and over and over again, it brought back all the pain and anxiety. I laid in bed alone, crying because I couldn't sleep. I was back to the beginning where I would cry all night. The images were so vivid in my mind. My mom called me upstairs and held me in her arms. The next day, my uncle explained what PTSD was like. As the air gets thicker, my chest feels like it's getting smaller. I realized that this is just the beginning of a long and terrible road. I easily jump at little things. I have panic attacks every time I cross the street. I hate fireworks for the reason that they make me cry. <laughs> Still to this day, the sound of tires screeching sends me into a panic as I look for my siblings. The pictures come racing back to my mind. Tears come racing down my face. And as I see is everyone is okay except for me. The pain is still sitting with me. The visions are always there to jump back at different times. It's been hard to be the oldest sibling, having to feel like I need to manage the house and deal with my own mental strain while my mother is constantly gone dealing with my sister's medical care. That one incident turned my life upside down and life has just hasn't been the same since. Most importantly, I just want to thank everyone who was there for my family and supported us unconditionally at the time my family was needed most. And for you, Darrell Brooks. I hope you know I've never had so much hate for someone until I met you. 
everyone saying that they wish Wisconsin had a death penalty for you? I simply disagree because you do not deserve a simple death. Those six people who passed did not have a simple death. I hope you sit and suffer every minute of your day. Thank you. Remember, these are children that have to deal with this level of emotion this young. Oh, God. I'm kind of glad I had a dap now. This is miserable. This was a rough afternoon, man. Um, I'm just one tourist victim, HH, and life after November 21st, 2021 will never be the same. I was dancing with the Waukesha Extreme Dance Team. I team, I team. I loved and committed countless hours too. Two weeks after the parade, I woke up in the hospital, confused, uncomfortable, and in pain. I remember doctors telling my mom that I needed to have a major surgery to fix my pelvis that was broken in three places so I'd be able to walk again and dance again. I was nervous, scared, and I just wanted to be with my family again. After my surgery, my doctor told me that I had to be in a wheelchair until my pelvis was healed. When I got in my wheelchair, I felt stuck, trapped in a place that I just wanted to get out of. When I got to see my sisters and brother for the first time ever since the parade, I could just see the weight lifted off their shoulders when they saw me. I was not okay, but I was there. When I finally got home after a month of being in the hospital, it was nonstop appointments and physical therapy. Two days after I got discharged from the hospital, I had to go back for an emergency surgery because I couldn't breathe. We found out that being on the ventilator caused scar tissue to build around my trachea. I've had over 15 surgeries on my trachea since then. My mom had to help me with all my personal care and other needs, including showering, getting dressed, using the bathroom, doing my hair and making my food until I learned how to get around easier. I had to go to physical therapy to learn how to walk again. When I started using a walker, I felt embarrassed and that people were just staring at me. I remember wanting to dance again, being with my team again, but knowing that I couldn't physically dance. I had to reteach my body to move how it used to move. Learning how to dance all over again. My balance was off, making dancing impossible at first. But the mental pain was worse, as I couldn't watch my teammates dance without me. I missed over half of the school year. When I got back to school, I felt uncomfortable being in a wheelchair. I felt like people were just looking and wondering. I missed out on my last year and days at elementary school. Time and memories that I will never get back. This past summer, I had to go in for my second major surgery. The surgery was on my trachea called a trachea resection. The doctors decided to do the surgery because I still couldn't breathe after all my procedures. My throat wouldn't stay open and it closed up to 80%. I was basically breathing through the size of a drinking straw. Now I have a scar across my neck that stands out and won't ever go away. And a scar where I had surgery to fix my pelvis and multiple other scars for the hor hor horrific things that happened that night. My scars make me insecure of my body and that I can't wear regular swimsuits because I can feel people's eyes on me. When I wear shorts, I have limbs speaking out and my scars, my scars will be there forever. So I will every day be reminded of what happened to me. Beyond my original month in the hospital, I 
I missed out on my entire summer because I was recovering from surgeries. <coughs> When I went back, when I went home, I wasn't able to do normal eleven-year-old things. I wasn't able to swim, jump, go on rides at fairs. All I could do was watch, watch people have fun during their summer, watch people play during their summer. While I continued to watch, <coughs> I had to act like it didn't bother me because I didn't want to ruin summer for everyone else. Now I am 12 years old in sixth grade. I'm happy that I'm at a new school with new people. Now people won't treat me differently because they don't know my medical past. Now that I'm in sixth grade, I have to ride the bus. I hate going to the bus stop because it scares me whenever cars drive by me or make noises. I'm also dancing again. I do two three hour practices each week and this past weekend I had my first dance competition which was a big deal to me because this is my first competition in a year now. I still have appointments and procedures on my trachea to see how everything is healing. I also got cleared from physical therapy. I've gotten really far this year. It is getting closer and closer to November 21st and I don't think I'm ready for this day to come. On this day each year I and many others will think how a peaceful event that has been a tradition in Waukesha for over 50 years and brought smiles and laughter to everyone turned into tragedy. I want to say thank you to my coach Alyssa for proving to me that I can do anything I put my mind to. Thank you to Ms. Hansen for helping me write my statement when I didn't know how to put everything into words. Thank you to all the doctors and nurses who took care of me in the hospital. And most important, thank you to my mom who was by my side for the whole tra tragic journey. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Amber, mother of Jocelyn Torres. I've been very open all this time about the injuries my daughter has obtained the night of November 21st, 2021. I even created daily logs so people could stay informed on her condition. But I've never truly talked about my feelings and how that day has affected my family. So this will be a very hard one for me. Let me put picture one. The event started off joyous and I had four of my children with me that evening, all of which still suffer in some form to this day. The screams, the sounds of the people being hit, watching as their bodies flew, the visions of their bodies lying everywhere, and me yelling, searching for Jessalyn, still replays over and over in my head. I found my daughter lying in front of the music truck, nowhere near the rest of her teammates, in the middle of the five points with her clothes ripped from her body road rash everywhere, blood leaking out of the corner of her mouth and half of her face missing. Picture two. My poor child was ripped out of her shoes, drug under the front end and thrown out from that vehicle. There was no ambulance, no medical equipment, nothing to help me and my child. I have never felt this helpless in my life. All I could do was hold my child and tell her mommy was here and that she will be okay. Picture three. A deputy and an officer came to help get my daughter on top of the blankets that were covering her naked body and drove us to the hospital in the back of an SUV. I am grateful for the actions they took that day, along with all the others who ran out into the street to help my daughter. When we got to Children's Hospital, I sat there in a chair numb as I watched multiple doctors, nurses, and medical staff rush in and out of the room examining my child's lifeless body. My mental state was confused. I lost who I was, and I felt like I was sitting in the middle of some crazy movie scene where there was so much commotion around you, but you hear none of it. I stayed numb from then on. It was my coping mechanism. There was no way to prepare myself for the news I was about to hear from the medical staff. 
Her injuries included a fractured skull, a hematoma behind her eye, eight broken ribs, which was four on each side, bilateral lung contusions, three fractured lumbar vertebrae. Her bowel was damaged. Her kidney was ripped from its blood supply and was dying. She now only has one kidney left. Her liver was lacerated. Her pelvis broken in three areas, going from front to back and down the middle in the shape of a T, and in two areas on the back side. Her spine has a permanent curve in it. Severe road rash all over her body. Pictures four or five. Go to five, please. That's her backside from being drugged. Go to the next one, please. That's the other side of her backside from being drugged. Next one, please. That's her leg. A whole chunk of meat was missing from her leg. You can take those down, please. She was given multiple bags of blood and platelets as we were transferred to the fourth floor ICU for critical care. It was there that the doctor sat me down and explained how she needed to be intubated because of the extensive damage to her lungs and body. The hardest moments of my life was making the phone call to my children. The hardest moment of my life was making the phone call to my other children so they could tell their sister how much they loved her because I had no idea what was to come next. They were so confused and scared and I could hear the hurt and pain in their voices. And I had no explanation to give them other than just tell your sister how much you love her. I couldn't be there to hold them while they cried in a time that they needed me the most. I still hold so much guilt because I couldn't be there with them since I had to be with their sister whose life was uncertain at the time. They were also mentally and emotionally traumatized. There were so many times I just wanted to hold Jessalyn or lay in the bed next to her, but I couldn't since there were tubes coming from every direction and her head, hands were tied down to the bed. The most I could do was hold her hand, stroke her head and whisper in her ear, I love you and mommy is here. I believe it was day two when we spent three to four hours just to thoroughly clean out all of the road rash. And it took multiple attempts to get as much as the leaves, sticks and rocks out of her hair. There were so many sleepless nights. Every day there were new issues, high fevers, allergic reactions, sepsis, and monitors that were blaring and alarming because her stats were up and down constantly. I felt like I just could not catch a break. She was not easy to keep sedated and there were so many wrestling matches to keep her as still as possible. It was all so exhausting, but yet I had to hold it all together. I had to be the rock. I hated watching the machine they used to help clear out her lungs. It was similar to a nebulizer, but had a force so strong and it was so loud. It would pump the meds in and jostle her whole body. Just hearing how loud the machine was and watching her body being uncontrollably shaken was overwhelming but it had to be done to clear all the fluid and mucus buildup from all the damage that you caused to her lungs. The time we were trying to wean her off the ventilator, I sat and watched the machine, hoping this girl would start to breathe on her own and not rely on the machine to do it for her. It took days and many trials. I would get my hopes up and then they would be let down. I would talk to her. Come on, Jessa, you have to breathe above the machine. You can do it, and I believe in you. Until finally I realized she wasn't ready. I just let her know it was okay, and I'm here by your side. And when you are ready, I will still be here right next to you by your side. I had so many mixed emotions the day Jessalyn was extubated. I couldn't wait to hear her voice again, to hug her, and to tell her how much I missed her. It felt like my girl was being reborn again, but I was not expecting the new hardships to come. She has had a total of 18 surgeries. Her first major surgery was to fix her pelvis. 12 hours my child was gone away from me that day. She now has a metal plate with 11 screws holding her pelvis together for the rest of her life. Picture eight, please. It took months for her to start to walk again. I never imagined that at 11 years old, we would be celebrating the first time she sat up or stood 
and of all things, take out a tube feeding. You can go to picture nine. How does that look for sitting up? Does she look happy? I don't think so. Winning off the narcotics and dealing with the hallucinations she had was terrible. She was so mean at times and it hurt more than you could imagine on this inside, but I knew that that wasn't my child. Deep down, I was so angry, frustrated, and wanted to scream. So I'd just step out of the room and cry a little, take a deep breath, and walk back into that room stronger than I was before. You can take that down. Discharge day was so exciting and scary. I could finally see my two-year-old, my other children, and be comfortable in my home. But managing all of Jessalyn's medical appointments, medications, daily shots, and personal needs on top of caring for four other children was difficult. Her dignity was taken away as I had to do everything for her for personal cares. And want, what 11-year-old wants her mom to wash their bottom? She would get frustrated trying to use both the wheelchair and a walker, and half the time she would forcefully shake that walker around and toss it off to the side. And having to load and unload her wheelchair, walker, and medical equipment took about 30 minutes in the freezing cold. The first day I had to take Jessa and my two-year-old out was rough. When backing out of the driveway, I ran over her walker and broke it. <laughs> I laugh now, but yep, I forgot to put it in the car. I sat there in disbelief, laughing and crying all at the same time. I was a mental wreck. <laughs> we ended up back at Children's Hospital a couple of days after discharge when Jocelyn was struggling to breathe. Found out she was suffering from tracheal stenosis from the initial prolonged intubation. You can picture time. That was the hole she was trying to breathe through. About the size of a straw, a little bit smaller. 80% of her trachea was closed off. You can go to picture 11. That's the size they had to pop it open to, just so that way she could actually breathe. You can turn that off, please. I slept on my couch for months because her breathing was so bad that I was scared she would stop breathing in her sleep. 15 surgeries on her trachea before we made the decision to do a tracheal resection. I hated the thought of doing this major surgery, the thought of possibly opening her chest to lift the chest muscles to give more stretch to the trachea, or the possibility of injuring her vocal cords along with all the other risks. They were also very overwhelming. We only get one breathing tube, and if this major surgery wasn't successful, then she would end up with a hole and a tube in her neck for the rest of her life to breathe from. Justin and I both cried together after that doctor left the room. How do you mentally prepare yourself or even your child for this type of news? Tell her, telling her that she would be asleep and intubated for another two weeks and in the ICU and then eventually go home once we did the whole removing the tube, feeding, sitting, standing, walking, and everything all over again. We were all going back to square one. She was so calm that day when she left the room for her surgery, but I knew she was freaking out on the inside. She held herself together so well. And I remember her looking at me saying, mom, why are you crying as I let the silent tears roll down my face? That surgery took six and a half hours. I stared out windows and paced for hours, hoping for the best outcome. On day two after that surgery, a lobe of her lung collapsed. She was running fevers and she was retaining too much fluid. We continued for days with her vitals going sky high then dangerously low, fevers up to 104 and she became septic all over again. It was day four through the night when everything become be, became beyond scary. Her body swelled in a matter of hours and scans became came back showing that she had pneumatosis intestinalis and necrotizing enterocolitis. And she was almost rushed down for an emergency bowel resection as this had become life-threatening extremely fast. There was no real understanding as to why this was happening other than that her intestines were not fully healed from the parade incident. Her body was shutting down. Nine days she spent on the ventilator, a total of 12 in the ICU and more on the main floor. It was another full two weeks stay at Children's Hospital, two weeks of mental and emotional upset and two weeks away from my other children. And if you are sitting here thinking that being taken off the ventilator is all pretty rainbows and butterflies, you're wrong. It's nothing like what you see on TV.
She struggled to breathe and cough up all that mucus for hours. Hours. Her mental state was off as she thrashed around and freaked out as the nurses were adjusting her bed, screaming, Mom, help, help me, Mom, they're going to shock me back to life. She thought that she was dying and that they were going to kill her. I knew that she had some worries before that surgery, but to this extent was beyond belief. We had to give her meds to calm her as her thrashing around was our biggest fear as that could tear her trachea all over again. Even on all those drugs, isn't it funny how she can still express how traumatizing this has all been? The summer went on with more appointments, physical therapy, surgeries, activity restrictions, winning off on narcotics that made her so mean to the point that I had to step away and do that silent cry again. We tried to find a little happiness in every event that we could. It was hard for her to watch her teammates who were all back dancing. She cried because she wanted to go watch the state competition, but couldn't since she had to be in another surgery. We felt left out and alone as we were still dealing with major medical issues months later. When out in the public, people would gawk, make hand gestures, and make comments about the scars across her neck. Number 13. <clears throat> Along with the marks and lumps on her body. Kids are cruel and have made some really harsh comments to the point I have felt the surge of uncontrollable anger. She was tired that day. <laughs> <sighs> At fairs and festivals, Jocelyn wasn't able to ride rides because of the possibility of tearing her trachea. You can take it down. She was so sad and angry, more angry than sad. Her friends and family were having a blast while she was standing watching my heart hurt for her i had to talk her through the anger over and over and over and teach her how to find happiness in everything we do no matter how big or how small but she was right it wasn't fair she shouldn't have had to suffer not one person should have had to my heart was broken the day she purposely stood out in the sun because she wanted the scars off of her face can you, pull it? you can post it my heart was broken the day she purposely stand out in the sun because she wanted the scars off of her face and wanted her beautiful brown skin back. I guess it made sense to her that tanning would help. While riding in the car, she, would, she will freak out when there is a squirrel on the road. A squirrel, okay, a squirrel. She gasps, yells, and throws her arms out and hits me. While I'm calming her, I sit there and envision how I'm sure that that's the exact reaction she had right before she took your SUV to her chest. This is all just a small fraction of what we have been, what we've all been through and what I've had to push through in the last year. You can take it down. Jocelyn still has ongoing medical care, more surgeries, more appointments, memory loss, pain in her hip and permanent curve in her spine. I hate the comments she makes about whenever she feels her hardware in her hip. But my girl is a warrior. She is back dancing. She may not be at the skill level she used to be, but she has not given up. As a parent, I have held so much guilt for not protecting my child that day. I have sat there by my child when she was at her worst. I was there for every little step of progress and I was there for every setback. I have cried, I have been angry. I have had to deal with fear mental trauma, PTSD, exhaustion, frustration, defeat, loneliness, and anxiety attacks. There are days when I feel that SUV hitting my chest and can't breathe as if I am my daughter. 
I could feel her pain and it was excruciating. There had been times where I felt justice wouldn't be served until he had to take that SUV to his chest, drug, thrown, and left with his bare body in the middle of the street, exactly the same way he treated my child. This man has brought out such an ugly side of me I never knew existed. It's not your life on the line, Mr. Brooks, and it never has been. It was my child's life on the line that night, along with many others. And as much as you were hoping to get some sympathy, I have none to give. I'm glad I don't have to hear those words come from your mouth anymore. I guess you should have thought about all those children of yours that you don't get to hold before you decide to turn that corner and step on that gas pedal. And I hope the look on my daughter's face before you ran her over haunts you for the rest of your life. Your immature behavior of rolling your eyes and twirling your fingers doesn't bother me. I have fought through one of my biggest fears this past year, and I won. I am much stronger than you. I have found my peace. This man may have been able to turn my life upside down and almost take my daughter from me, take time away from my other children, create such heartache, pain, and mental turmoil, but the one thing he was not successful at was taking my strength, Jessalyn's strength, along with the strength I have instilled in all my other children. He doesn't get the satisfaction of thinking we have become weak. My family has grown stronger, have become closer, and now have a better appreciation for the time we have together. He did not, cannot, and will not break me. Thank you. Thank you. The day November 21st came around, I was excited to dance with all my best friends. Little did I know, that was the worst day of my life. That day changed my life forever. My family and my friends thought that, that was the last day they would have with me. I can't even imagine what everyone was going through while I was unstable in a coma with a brain injury that later led to me having to get part of my skull taken out and put back in two months after. This major change in my life was all from the car that had struck me and many others on November 21st, 2021. I became worried and stressed because people treated me differently and I saw myself as no longer strong, but weak. I didn't like that I could have a seizure. I lost my hair and it made me feel bad about myself. This made a huge impact on my life. It changed the way my friends and family all see me now. I hated myself and I hated what I had to go through. It was hell. I just want all the awful days in the hospital, trauma, all procedures to be put behind me so I can continue to live my life like all the days before the worst, November 21st, 2021. However, since I am a victim of the Christmas parade, this will always stay with me. Thank you. Good afternoon. As I stand here before you today, I realize that you don't know who I am. I have been here almost every single day since this trial started. I realize that I am what, what I am about to share will not change what happened that day, but I hope it will give me some sort of peace and help me continue to heal. The Waukesha Christmas Parade was an event that both of my daughters have been involved in for many years with their dance team. This year on the day of the parade, it was very cold and windy. So instead of walking alongside the dancers, I decided to take on a new role. I volunteered volunteered to sit in the bed of the pickup truck that was leading our dance team. I was filling all the parent volunteer buckets with candy. I had the best view of my daughter the entire time. She was in the front row, dancing her heart out and doing what she loved most. In one split second, all of that happiness ended. Through the parade route at an incredibly high speed, I saw your pickup truck approaching the girls. At that moment, 
No level of screaming could be heard because of the music playing in the background. The dancers did not see you coming, but I did. It was horrifying. These girls that I have become so close with flying through the air, losing their shoes, their hats, and their gloves. A sight I will never be able to forget. This is a vision that will haunt me for the rest of my life. I jumped out of the pickup truck so fast, not knowing where my daughter's body had landed. Once I was able to locate her body, I took one look at her and I thought she was dead. She was not moving. She had blood coming from her head, her ears, her nose, her arms and legs. She was not awake or responding. I was unable to keep my composure. With my shaking hands and through my tears, I somehow managed to call my husband. He had stayed home with our youngest daughter who was homesick. If she had not been ill that day, she would, have been, she would have been dancing alongside her sister. I tried to explain to my husband what had happened, but honestly, I don't remember much after that. Meanwhile, a man who I believe was a spectator at the parade came to my aid as I was trying to explain to my husband over the phone what had happened. This good Samaritan also had to keep me away from my daughter who was lying lifelessly on the ground. As her mother, all I wanted to do was pick her up and hold her. However, I was unable to because she needed medical attention. All of the injured girls from our team were being triaged right there in the middle of the street. I remember screaming out loud, asking what was taking so long for an ambulance to arrive. In hindsight, I realized it was only minutes, but during that moment, it felt like eternity. Everything just seemed to be moving in slow motion. Samantha was taken to Waukesha Memorial in the first ambulance that was able to get to us. She was later transferred to Children's Hospital because doctors realized that was the best place for her to be at the time. And due to the overwhelming amount of injuries from your reckless and thoughtless behavior, Waukesha Memorial needed more space for other hurt individuals. The other people that you carelessly hit. Thankfully, I was able to ride in the ambulance both time with my daughter hoping and praying she would survive. Once at Children's Hospital, Samantha was taken for a second set of scans to evaluate what needed to be done. We quickly learned that she needed immediate surgery where they would do a craniotomy to relieve the pressure from her brain, brain swelling. When she came back from her emergency surgery, I lost it. She was intubated in a medically induced coma and her head was wrapped in gauze. I just wanted to talk to her, her to talk to me so badly. I wanted to hear her voice and know that she was okay. At that moment, I would have done anything to switch places with her and take her pain away. Mr. Brooks, how could you possibly do this to someone? I need you to listen to me as I list her injuries. Acute respiratory failure, bradycardia, a skull fracture, multiple skull fractures. Five fractures in different areas of her, of her face, including the mastoid bone behind her ear, the bones that hold her eye into place, a fractured cheekbone, a brain bleed, an intracranial hemorrhage. Did you hear? The doctors told us that they did not know what the outcome of her injuries would be. They would not give us any false hope. They told us they did not know if she would survive. My husband and I did not know what the rest of her life would look like. If she survived, would she be able to walk? Would she be able to talk? We had no idea what the future would hold for Samantha. Our daughter was in a coma for two weeks in the critical intensive care unit at Children's Hospital. They needed to make sure that her brain was healing properly. Those were the hardest two weeks of my life. My husband and I lived at Children's Hospital, never leaving her side. We spent every hour, every hour of every day watching her body temperatures, her brain pressures, and the clock. We spent Thanksgiving at Children's Hospital trying to find as much time to spend with our youngest daughter who was not allowed to see her sister because of COVID restrictions. Weeks later, once medical prof prof uh, personnel believed it was safe, she was slowly taken off her sedation meds. That was when her battle took a turn. Samantha is a fighter and she would, she was not about to let you destroy her life. 
Samantha had to learn how to swallow food. We spent weeks learning how to talk and walk again. Because of you, Samantha suffered a traumatic brain injury. She was unable to live a 14-year-old teenager's life. We struggle not knowing if or when she will have another seizure. Because of you, my daughter had her most beautiful hair shaved off. After spending 22 days in children's hospital, she was finally discharged. Finally being home with both my children was far better than Christmas morning. Even though it's almost been a year since this tragedy, it's still so painful to see her struggling with some everyday life experiences. I consider Samantha a gift. Based on the injuries she sustained from being hit by your vehicle, she should have died that day. But she didn't. And for that, I am so grateful. My heart goes out to those families who were not as fortunate. Since the first day you appeared in this courtroom, you have, been, you have done nothing but make a mockery of this trial. I sat here every day listening to you act like this was just a game and showing no remorse for what you did. I have no forgiveness in my heart for you. You said as a father, it hurt because you could not hold your babies, but yet you run over my child like she didn't mean anything. What kind of father does that? Because of you, our lives have been changed forever. Whatever pain you may encounter in prison will only be a fraction of what Samantha endured after this tragedy. Judge, we ask that you give Mr. Brooks the maximum sentence for each count without the chance of parole. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I think there are only six counts. I mean, if you're talking about emotionally, sure. We have one more statement. All right, guys, looks like the last one. And then we'll see. I mean, Hi. 450 Hi. there. Oh, I forgot my pictures in the hallway. Can you grab my pictures? I'm sorry. Yeah, one, one other thing. There's just two. This just doesn't get better, does it? Okay, sorry. I'm no, this is the last one. I'm in the hallway. Um, this is our daughter, Olivia. She is the baby of our family. Um, that photo was taken on November 21st, 2021. At that time, she was an innocent eight-year-old who was excited to get to perform in the, the parade with her best friend and her teammates. And it was something she looked forward to every year. Um, my mother-in-law and myself and I also um, join her every year and hand out candy. And it's something that's become, um, I guess, a tradition that um, was taken away from us by, by Daryl Brooks because of his selfless, <clears throat> just uh, ability to, to have, please don't do that. It's so disrespectful. I've watched all day on TV and I've watched you mock all of the victims all day. 
you roll your eyes and you make faces. If this was your eight-year-old daughter that someone else hit, you would have been beside yourself if someone made those faces. And you want people to have forgiveness for you and your child? You're insane. I hope that that the judge puts the most amount of, of years on your sentence. And I hope that you live in hell for the rest of your life for what you have done to all of these victims. Do you realize after you hit me and my mother-in-law, I spent five minutes walking around looking for my daughter on the ground. I was looking for her through little girls that were keeled up in little fetal positions because you had ran them over. You hit them with 3,300 pounds and you don't care. Right before you hit me, I turned around and I looked at you. I didn't see your car. I saw the look in your eye. You knew exactly what you were doing. You knew exactly what you wanted to do. And that was because you are a narcissistic piece of shit that thinks you can get away with everything. And you are not going to ever get away with anything ever again. You did what you wanted to do, which was instill fear and horror in all of these children that are involved. You're a child killer. A woman killer. I cannot wait until somebody inflicts that harm on you. I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm done. That's Olivia. And the next one is my daughter in the hospital room where I sat next to her for five days where she didn't move. My daughter who was in the ICU for five days and in and, and, and children's for an additional nine more in the critical care unit because of her brain injuries that you caused to her that she still deals with daily. I was late because I couldn't leave her because she didn't want me to leave because of her separation anxiety that you caused. You should not be allowed to be a father to your children. I'm so glad that you are being kept from them. The shit you would teach them would make them as, as evil and miserable as a person that you are. Her daughter is victim GG, or maybe I have mixed up the designation, but that's yeah, that one else one. I believe that was GG and the daughter is back. Okay, thank you. I believe that that concludes the statements, Your Honor. Thank you. Attorney Operates 456, do you want to make your statements yet tonight? Whatever the court wishes, Your Honor, I probably have about 15 minutes worth of comments, but. How many? About 15, I would say. Um, I'd like to have you conclude okay. tonight. I just want to take just a short break sure. um, before we do that. Um, I think we all could use probably a short comfort break and a stretch break, and then we'll be back in about five, 10 minutes uh, you. to hear your remarks. <clears throat> Wow. <clears throat> wow. She, I mean, it's warranted, but she, she let loose. I mean, that's a great one to end on. It, it really is. I, that, that, that's the more frustrated for, I mean, but that's fine. I mean, you know, yeah, you kind of dodged a bullet. This was a rough afternoon. It was a rough yeah. morning. Yeah, true. But this, but this didn't get any better. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. what we expected. We expected it. Yeah, that's true. But uh, yeah, those kids were, were really tough. And uh, a lot of people, people have expressed in the chat, too. It's like, you know, a lot of times we, we try to, like, do something fun or entertaining. Obviously, this isn't fun or entertaining. But it it's better to watch with a group. Yeah. 
and I, I again I think it's I think it's important. I, I do yeah. think it's important to put it into the context of what happened here. Um, so I guess they're going to give their closing statements and it'll wrap up. So tomorrow might be a little bit more entertaining since it's going to be his witnesses. So, I, I, you know, it's funny because I just don't do this. So with the sentencing, they, they get a, I guess it makes sense. It's sort of a closing statement on sentencing. Mm-hmm. I don't know why she's got 15 minutes. I mean... I mean, it's basically just wrapping up what the victim impact statements in aggregate. Yeah, they've been excellent. They, they've been they excellent all the way through. I don't know why you'd need 15 minutes. I mean, I think that the witnesses basically spoke for themselves. You could you could cover it with do your worst, Judge. Yeah, I, I would Ma- literally... Maxim wherever you can. There, that's the state's position. Yeah, the state's position is you heard everything that everybody said. Do what yeah. they asked for. <laughs> I've got nothing to add to that, honestly, yeah. I, I don't think I could say it better than any of them did. Right. But yeah, it today it, this was a rough day, but we got through it. Like I said, I'm I'm hoping tomorrow will be a little bit more entertaining. So I think that'll be back over on your channel. Yeah, that's and, it. Yeah. It's, it's tomorrow is eight thirty. Well, I, I, I guess we'll so, find yeah. out. But I actually I, clipped. I actually clipped a more entertaining one, which which was set, set up. But I, I guess I'll push it back. They're coming. They're coming back. So, I'll yeah. I'll just I'll just go over and start that stream. It's it's shorter. I'll start that stream when this, when this is done. All right. I mean, uh, if you want to shoot me a link, I'll swing by for a little bit. Yeah. I could use I could use a little bit of a palate cleanser. I mean, that that one's just a a wacky defendant who's methed out. It seems downright, you know, charming compared to to this scenario. Oh God, I, I'm so glad that somebody finally called him out on his behavior. Yeah, I really am. Well, it's not it, like he cares. No, he doesn't care. But you know what? It's something that everybody needed to hear, hear said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're right. You're right. So, Everyone's thinking it. So, if someone gave voice to it. That's probably good. Yeah, and for that to be kind of the last word. And she was like, you know, I'm sure she actually had prepared remarks, but she's like, I'm just so disgusted with you. I said what I want to say. I'm done. <laughs> well, you she's know? not happy, but uh, I'm like, I agreed with her. I'm like, you kind of covered it there. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. It was really powerful. Um, hey, I. Uh, the only way to get through this one was with everybody here. Yeah. Oh, tough uh, times. Yeah, tough times. No kidding. Guys, I don't know what, you know, if it's politics, there's a simple solution. Just freaking ignore it. I, I don't, I'm not going to be the freaking language police. That's just not what I do. You know, People were asking me to get religion out of out of my chat earlier, and I'm like, you know what? People can write whatever the hell they want. If you don't like it, ignore it. Yeah. You can block people too. So, like, whatever. I'm not dealing with that. That's the wrong day for that. Yeah, I think the judge absolutely needed a break. She was starting to dab tears at one point. I mean, pretty obviously. Yes, and and she and it's obvious to me that she was holding a lot back, but she kind of needs to. She does. She needs to maintain kind of the stoicism of the bench. Yeah. I mean, it, it, if you break down a little, it's understandable, but yeah, you minimize that as much as you can. Right. But I, I thought she handled that pretty well, given everything that was going on in front of her. Ugh. Oh, yeah. The first thing that happened when he came back in was he started arguing. So they had two witnesses, and then the second one he tried to object to and got into an argument with the judge and got kicked into the other room. And then when he was pulling that shit, somebody in the gallery shouted at him to basically go to hell and stop being a fucking retard. Right. <laughs> um, I think those were actually his words. Um, so, YouTube, that is a quote. Um But yeah, so he got kicked out too, but she let both of them back in and he was a little, Daryl was a little bit more chased after that. 
Um, let's see. What else do we got? I mean, the problem is he he doesn't care. He's he's full of hate. He doesn't care. No, he does not. At all. I, I, I don't see any evidence of it to this point. He he kind of tries to pretend like it because he wants some sympathy, but he does not care. He 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 has hatred for everybody else. He's mm-hmm. happy they're hurt, as far as I can tell. I I think that he is in honestly to some extent. It's almost like he's enjoying it. Oh yeah, which is sick. Well, like, um, okay, yeah, I, I got to injure a whole bunch of these people that I I don't like. Despite the fact that none of them has ever done anything to him. Exactly. Um, oh, this is one. So were you, you weren't there for this, were you? No. Um, so one of the guys pulled out two other people that should be, you know, considered responsible for this. And one is the mother. Mm-hmm. Which you were here for this, weren't you? And uh, then he had the DA that passed, uh, that, you know, pushed the bail reform stuff and let him out after a violent felony. Mm-hmm. So he was out on bond at the time because of Milwaukee DA's uh, kind of lax policies. And somebody called the DA out on that one during their statement, which was sort of interesting. Which I I tend to, it's kind of hard not to draw a thread there. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's that's just the current political climate, you know. Let everybody right. go. Well, I mean, well, you, then you get you get more stuff like this. I, there's no there's no toys about it. Well, look, it was my district where DeSantis fired the state's attorney. Yeah, I was the courthouse right up there because he refused to enforce the laws. And it's like, all right, if you're not going to, then we'll find well, he, somebody. He, he announced effectively, I'm above the law. He did do that. I don't I don't know if DeSantis had much of a choice. Like, no, uh, you you can't have officers of the court saying, no, I'm above the law. I I, de- I decide what it is. Well, it was great when he sued to try and get his job back. That that was an amazing complaint. I don't know if I, I don't know if somebody covered it. I did, I don't think I did. Yeah. Because I don't think I was on YouTube at the time yet. Um, <laughs> oh, John, you haven't been doing this long enough to get spacey about what you've covered and, and haven't yet. Uh, you know what? I I think I might have been on somebody else's show talking about it. Yeah, that's remember. true. Um. Let's see. Where am I at here? We will. Mike's got something after this. We'll we'll do a little bit of something fun. I think that's the plan. Um, guys, freaking ignore him. I, I I don't know how to say that more clearly. I'm tired. Of, like. I'm not doing chat police. If you don't like it, don't listen. You don't have to read it. Um, yep, covered that. Again, as long as you're not making personal attacks against people and it's not blatantly atrocious, fine. I don't care. Like, seriously, we're all adults here. I'm not playing fucking babysitter when it comes to free speech. I'm a little bit of an absolutist when it comes to that. Um, <laughs> yeah. God knows we do. <laughs> oh, Nigel. Thank so you very great. much, Nigel. I appreciate it. You're the best. Um, yep. Absolutely expected. Totally. Uh, yeah. I, I wasn't surprised at all. And I wasn't surprised. I was surprised that more people didn't call him out, that it took until the last person to finally tell, like, literally stick it to him on that. I was a little surprised by that part. Well, what I what I actually found at first, I found it annoying. But when he rolled his eyes, that means you hit him. That, that, that's, that means in, in, in his little pea brain, whatever it is, that's when he really took offense. He'd roll his eyes. Yeah, and that's when that's people true. called him a monster, or told him he was, you know, a loser in some form or other, which yeah, he is. He didn't, he didn't care about that part. Um, I have no idea since then, but thank you for the super chat. I know we have some folks from Waukesha, so you know there's some GoFundMe's and stuff that uh, Knight has been posting. If you want to try and help out. That would be 
probably a nice thing to do for them. I'm sure that they have a ridiculous amount of medical bills across that community right now. <laughs> Thanks, old man. See, Mike, I can do it. <laughs> oh. Well, this this is a tough. It's just tough on the soul, but it it is kind of. It is good. It is good. It is good that they, that people watch and hear what they've been through. I think, I think it's good for all involved. Yeah. By the way, Knight is absolutely right. That is my standard. So as long as it's within YouTube's parameters, uh, this is a free speech zone as far as I'm concerned. That's just the way that I roll, you know? Court's, court's back. All right, let's do it. Unless we're being trolled. Felon nope, in possession we're not. of a firearm. And I'm the probably muted. The violation is July 24, 2020. He was released on cash bail in that case in March of 21. In that case, the allegation is that he got into a fight with his nephew. And as his nephew was leaving the area, the defendant fired one shot from a handgun toward the vehicle that his nephew was in. The vehicle was occupied by one other person, and therefore he was charged with two counts. The next day, he was taken into custody, and a loaded Beretta 9 millimeter handgun was located just a few feet away from him. That handgun had previously been reported stolen. I believe he has court on those files later this week in Milwaukee County, Your Honor. As far as convictions are concerned, there's a 2012 conviction from May, May 15th, 2012, resisting obstructing misdemeanor in Milwaukee Thanks, County. Charles. Sentenced to 30 day, 37 days jail consecutive to any other sentence. 423 of 2012, there were two files disposed of in Milwaukee County. One of them charged uh, misdemeanor bail jumping and possession of marijuana. He was sentenced to 180 days in the House of Correction on both counts concurrent. There was another file for felony possession of THC as a second or subsequent offense. He was also sentenced to 180 days in the House of Correction for that file. I'm sorry, what was the conviction for? A felony possession of THC as a second or subsequent <coughs> offense. On April 30, 2010, he was convicted in Wood County of strangulation slash suffocation with other charges for battery and criminal damage to property dismissed and read in. There was a withheld sentence for three years probation. Ultimately, it was revoked in 2011 and he was sentenced to serve 11 months jail. 2009, Conviction from Manitowoc County for misdemeanor obstructing, sentenced to two days jail, time served. 2005 conviction from Langlade County. Actually, it was a, a county ticket for disorderly conduct. He never paid the fine on that, so he ultimately served 30 days jail. 2003 conviction in Milwaukee County for resisting obstructing. 20 days in the House of Correction. 2002 conviction, Milwaukee County, felony possession of THC, second or subsequent offense, 50 days in the House of Correction. 2000, convicted of substantial battery, party to a crime, sentenced to prison, withheld, and three years probation imposed along with six Nigel. months of right. condition you know, time, I think you're probably a little bit right. That probation was ultimately revoked and he was sentenced to prison. That's his record from the state of Wisconsin. He has a record from the state of Nevada. June of 2016, he was charged with a sex offender registry violation, failed to appear in court on that offense. And there is currently an outstanding warrant for his arrest active in the state of Nevada. 2007, he pled guilty to statutory 
sexual seduction as a felony. Yes. A suspended sentence was ordered for 36 months probation. That's what led to the uh, sex offender uh, registry requirement, which he is currently non compliant with. In December of 2006, there were two files disposed of in Nevada. Uh, one was a domestic battery as a misdemeanor. He received a suspended sentence. And the other, he was found guilty at trial of obstructing misdemeanor and sentenced to jail. In the state of Georgia, he has a conviction from May of 2021. I'm sorry. Not, an, not a conviction, an arrest from May of 2021 for misdemeanor battery, domestic violence. The disposition of that case is unknown. And uh, of course, there's a paternity action that was pending here in Waukesha County that uh, had been uh, a warrant or capius had been issued for him on at least eight occasions during the life of that file. That's a 2003 case. He was sentenced to jail on several occasions for failing to pay child support. He uh, was once allowed Huber privileges on a jail sentence, but had the, those Huber privileges revoked in 2009. Most recently, there was a warrant issued in August of 2021. And uh, Judge Maxwell signed an order to lift a stay of a 120 day jail sentence. That is the extent of his criminal history that we are aware of, Your Honor. Um, I think it's very plain on its face. He's a lifelong criminal. He is someone who has repeatedly, continuously uh, disobeyed law enforcement based on the resisting, obstructing uh, type charges. There's multiple counts of bail jumping disregarding court orders disrespecting court of orders. of course he's free to go drive there's a car into a acts of violence awesome there's weapons violations <laughs> this man has a history and a pattern of engaging in violent dangerous behavior in the community and it was no different on november 21 of 2021. i'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the attack and I choose to call it an attack instead of referring to it as the parade, as somebody mentioned. There's nothing wrong with the parade. The parade is good. The parade is the embodiment of a community. That's what you expect to see at a parade is children at a parade, families, people from all over the area coming together for a joyful, happy event. That's the problem. The parade will continue. It never should have been. It will kick off Never again should. in a few short weeks. And I hope and pray there's joy and laughter and kids in the street collecting candy. That's what it should be. So I'm not going to refer to this case as the parade. I'm going to refer to it as what it was, an attack. And the facts are very clear, Your Honor. Very few of the victims who were struck had any idea this car was barreling down on them. It's an act of a coward, plain and simple. They had no way to know it was coming. And he mowed over them and ran them over without any ability to defend themselves. What is so offensive about this conduct, Your Honor, is obviously the violent nature of it. But even more so, the defendant's conduct and behavior in this court, his complete lack of uh, regard for the decorum of the court, the respect of the court. And, and I don't mean you personally, of course you deserve that as well, but I mean for the sanctity of the court, the court room, the process that we as Americans respect and treasure and protect for well over 200 years, and he. I love Montana, but I'm doing this for our family. They will fight you dirty. Is there any people came into this? What's wrong with them running a mid-roll ad? Over the course of the trial and the proceedings, every one of them was able to sit 
and obey the court's order. If you ask them to stand up, they'd stand up. If you ask them to sit down, they'd sit down. If you told them courts in session, be quiet, they all would. Everyone was able to do that except Daryl Brooks. I think he was able to do it. I just don't think he wanted to. I just think this is all part of his charade. This referring to himself in the third person, trying to distract him or, or detract himself, I should say, from the events, taking absolutely no responsibility. It's the act of a narcissistic coward. Those words have been used here today and nothing could be further from the truth. He is a coward. He ran like a scared little chicken from this parade. Nice. Trying to slither away in the dark of night, but only to stop long enough and try and take advantage of good citizens that would help him. He calls and lies to his mom, right? Get me an Uber. I can't get into it. He lies to the officers repeatedly. We saw the time of his arrest. We heard the testimony from Daniel Ryder, a good man with good intentions and a good heart who took this murderer into his home and held him there long enough for the police to come and take him away without any knowledge whatsoever of what had gone on. He takes advantage of everyone. He's extremely manipulative. He absolutely thinks he's in control of everything. When in fact, as he sits here in custody, he's in control of nothing. This is getting except for his own yeah, behavior. He's roughly quiet. Except I'm for not his... going to sit here and be disrespected. Mr. Oh, yes, you are. You'll have your opportunity. These are sentencing arguments and they can make them. So I could do the same thing? Mr. Brooks, there's nothing disrespectful. They are doing it in yes, a respectful way. Yes, it is. Okay, way. call me out of my name again. Go ahead, Tony Opper. I just in time for Mike to leave. Come Judge, the, these are the facts. You heard from so many of these parents and so many of the people that were there of that fight or flight, right? That kicked in. He ran. He fled. He tried to protect his own self. That's get it. Get him. Get him. That's all he did. Everybody else sprang into action. Whether that action was to immediately account for their behavior for their family and get them out of there to safety, whether it was good Samaritans and judge, I really thought long and hard. I had a video clip that I was perhaps going to show to you. Um, you've seen a lot of this during the trial, but I mean, it comes from the clip when I showed during my closing argument. After a long day, guys, near the I end of the this. parade route where the Catholic community had been struck and all the shoes laying in the road and things like that. That person that took that video walked down Main Street for quite some time and captured quite a few images. And it's really quite powerful, but I also thought it's really quite painful. But one of the things that was just so remarkable to us as we watched things like that was the average citizens that just sprung into action to save somebody else. There's a particular moment where there's a person uh, on the ground fervently performing CPR on a victim in amongst a pool of blood without any regard for themselves whatsoever. I don't know who this person was. I don't think I'll ever know, but it's a prime example of the good that came out. So many people talk this afternoon about good versus evil, and I definitely believe that's what this case was about. Daryl Brooks is the epitome of evil. He yeah, is evil in person. Room, please. No, you may not. The community is I good. Order, the people course, are so I good. Can, I think it'd be the best for me to just are go good. Mr. Courtroom. Brooks, I'm talking. I don't care about you talking. I don't care what you care about. I know you don't. Sit Here down we go. and quiet. No. Everybody has told you no. that. No. No. Stop no. it. No. The prosecutor's so you got, you got it all wrong, Miss Opper. Judge, the community has spoken. This jury returned a verdict in two hours. That's how open and shut this is. Two case hours on was. 76 counts. Everybody counts. saw it. Actually, Everybody but Daryl Brooks. Thank you, thank you. This jury thank deserves you, you know. to be commended for their conduct, their God patience, you know. their service. Mr. Brooks, 
I, I asked to go to the other courtroom. I'm not so sending you there. So we wouldn't have to go. It's not, that is not a place you get to request to go to. It's so that's when you disrupt to, the proceedings. She's I'm almost done. Disrupt the proceedings. I'm trying to go to the other courtroom no. so she can finish saying the I BS wanted, she got to say. I wanted to share something with you, Judge. This is something that came in on December 5th, 2021. An anonymous letter came. Well, it's not anonymous. It's signed, but it's from a person we don't know from another state from the state of Kansas, December 5, oh my 2021. God. Yep. This person took time out of her day to write a card to, it's addressed to the Waukesha community and it was sent to our office. When the prosecutor tells wrote, you to shut the fuck up. We have been praying for the healing the judge of your community. It. Please know that there are people who care deeply all over this nation. That's the kind of message Daryl Brooks needs to hear because I know during the trial, uh, there was a lot of cards, a lot of messages received in my office and in your office. Good, hardworking, decent people that respect the law, that respect human life, that respect their neighbors, that would take the time to comment and say, good job. We support you. We are with you. And you saw that strength behind me all day. Those young Including kids, 13, children, people on law talk coming with up. I mean, <sighs> Your Honor, I'll say this. God is good. There's been a lot of talk about God. There's been a lot of talk about religion. Daryl Brooks brought the Bible into this courtroom. These children are remarkable for their strength, for their healing, their physical healing. We haven't met these kids before. We've never met them. We met them today for the first time. You would never know the across serious the country injuries and across that they the world as a result of Daryl Brooks by looking at them. Of course, there's much healing to be done. But isn't it remarkable that in a year's time, look how far we have come as a community. Look how far these families have come. These families, these victims that stood up and pointed to Daryl Brooks and said, you will not beat me. You will not knock me down. That's what we need to move forward with as a community, Your Honor. His behavior is done. We're done with him. He has forfeited his right to be in this courtroom. He's forfeited his right to be in our community, period. There is not one thing that mitigates this sentence, not one. He deserves the absolute maximum sentence on all counts consecutive. Look, Judge, you saw the videos. This wasn't him plowing in to one large group of 50 people at one point in time and hitting them. It was linear. He hit one, kept going, hit two, kept going, hit three, kept going all the way down the street. That's consecutive sentences, Your Honor. That's intentional, willful, volitional conduct that warrants consecutive sentences stacked one on top of the other, just as he stacked victims up as he drove down the road in complete disregard for any other person whatsoever. We kept the kids out of the courtroom in the trial, Judge, but boy, it's impactful to, to listen to them today and realize this isn't just, you know, victim GG. This is a child that you willfully ran over with a 3,000 pound vehicle, as so many people so uh, adeptly observed. Police officers, first responders, the medical professionals. It's kind of weird, Judge, because we're coming up on the anniversary, of course, and we're coming up on the weekend before Thanksgiving, which is a weekend that a lot of people pay attention to on the calendar because here in good old Wisconsin, it's deer hunting season. It's a lot of uh, families going out, starting their Christmas activities, uh, Christmas festivities, Christmas shopping, whatever it is. So it's kind of that kind of a weekend that comes around every year that on its own, it's not a holiday. It's not really a known day, but we all know that first weekend before Thanksgiving and what it brings. Uh, we all look forward to maybe a short work week, spending time with family, getting together, and here it comes, and it's the anniversary of this attack at the hands of Daryl Brooks. But 
we're going to have an ability to move on from that. We have the ability, we have the tools as a community, Your Honor, to do that. And that's definitely because of everyone, everyone that responded to this incident, the first responders, the police officers, the medical personnel that got paged in on a Sunday night when we're all hunkered down, Packers had played, it's cold, it's dark, and they all had to spring into action and, and respond. And there were law enforcement from all over Southeastern Wisconsin, fire department, EMTs. No one paused, no one hesitated for a second. They just came and helped. And I think that's something that our families, our community can build on as well, Your Honor, to say evil is easily overcome here. Daryl Brooks deserved to be locked up for the rest of his life. He cannot be trusted ever, ever again. I ask you to consider, um, I'm not gonna go into it, but uh, we had filed the other acts evidence, some of the language in that other acts evidence, the intimidation of the victim. It played out repeatedly in this courtroom. He tried to intimidate you, he tried to intimidate me, he tried to intimidate the witnesses. He tries and tries and tries, but he fails. He's not the strongest person in the courtroom. He's the weakest person in the courtroom. Morally bankrupt. That's what he is. His character is void. I, I asked Attorney Basie, what's the word I can use for low character? And then we came up with the fact he really has no character. It's one of the factors the court needs to consider. Protection of the public, severity of the crime, they all weigh heavily in a stacked sentence, Your Honor, consecutive maximum across the board. Every one of these victims deserves that. I don't know how we look at any of these victims and say, well, he got concurrent time on your case because your pain and suffering wasn't quite as bad as the guy before you or the girl before you. They all deserve that sentence that speaks to their count. The restitution, Your Honor, I filed the paperwork. We are seeking restitution in the dollar amounts uh, uh, from my letter that we reviewed this morning. Um, I'm asking under 973.20, sub 11, sub F, that you enter an order that the Department of Corrections shall uh, keep 50% of any wages Mr. Brooks may earn in prison and any uh, monies that may be paid on his books or canteen account and direct those monies to be paid directly towards restitution. He should not uh, be able to work or receive canteen without paying down that restitution. Um, I also included in my letter the request uh, that should any monies ever be paid by contract to Mr. Brooks that he should attempt to benefit financially from these crimes that those monies would be placed into an escrow account maintained by the Department of Justice and um, paid towards the restitution. The restitution in this case is ridiculously low when you consider it. And that's again, because of the generosity of good people all over the world that contributed to a community fund and uh, other individuals who generously donated to help these families pay for funerals and medical expenses and things like that. Can you imagine when you're, you heard these mothers describing what their children have been through? Can you imagine the medical bills on these? And he's lucky he's getting off with a $200,000 bill for restitution, Your Honor. I think he should have to pay every last penny of it. I also wanted to wrap up again, Your Honor, by saying you didn't hear from all the victims. Certainly, um, there were some that just cannot bring themselves to this court in any fashion, in any way. And um, we ask you to keep them in mind as well, um, especially the Bill Hospital family. Um, Bill was, you know, walking in support of his wife's uh, team and trying to be in a supportive role as he had done on many other uh, occasions and lost his life for that simple action, that simple act of good that he participated in. Um, 
There were some groups that um, are not represented here today, but I know you heard their story at trial and you're um, aware of what some of them went through that maybe um, wasn't specifically addressed here today, but I just ask you to keep in mind that uh, we certainly prevented, presented a wide array of victims to you, but not everyone. And then certainly, as I mentioned at the outset, the community as a whole uh, absolutely demands justice for, for the, these victims, these families, and for the community itself that Daryl Brooks has no redeeming value, Your Honor. Thank you. Nice. Right, thank you. Um, Mr. Brooks, as far as I can tell from the correspondence from your mom and from you, I believe there may be closer to three individuals plus yourself who wish to speak at sentencing. Um, since we lost an hour or so today, although we did go late, so and arguably we gained it back, I yeah, still was different. thinking about starting at noon just to make sure there's ample time. Um, I will start the, fault of the, insured. the Zoom shortly before that. Um, the information has been provided to your mother, and I believe she will provide it to the other individuals on your list who wish to attend and make a statement on your behalf. Oh, well. So right at noon, we will start that process. Typically, um, I would hear from the individuals on your behalf with you going last, but you tell me if you want it to go a different order. Uh, that's fine. All right, and then I'll hear from you. I may take a short break before I come back out um, or even a longer break, depending on the timing of everything tomorrow uh, to just collect all of the final statements uh, and process them. Obviously, I'll take the overnight to process what I've heard today uh, in addition to what I've already been doing on my own. Um, and I haven't seen any written statements on your behalf. Um, I don't know if anything came in today during this hearing, uh, but uh, I'll rely on the verbal statements that are made and then yours at the time of sentencing uh, or prior to the imposing sentencing, okay? I apologize. I'm, it's, it's very emotional and frustrating right now, so I apologize to you, Your Honor, and court. I understand it's, it's frustrating, and I understand that. It's just very hard to sit in, you know, it's almost like a pile So I, I still understand that I have to conduct myself. Uh, I don't give a damn about your frustration. Yeah. Don't care. I think the apology needs to be made to the victim, sir, more so than this court. Well said, Judge. Mm -hmm. I was just referring to. I know. The... All right. Anything else from either party before we conclude for this evening from the state? No, Judge. We'll see you at noon. Thank you. From you, sir. Right, All right. We are in recess. I'll see everyone tomorrow at noon. Thank you. Wow. Oh, great. <laughs> well, I did do with some fireworks. That was wild. By the way, I didn't miss any of that. I switched into my comfy shirt. I got I got my emotional support. This is this is a milkshake that I'm spooning out here. I, I got an emotional support milkshake, and then I got a phone call on the hot situation I had to deal with, and I was still listening while doing it. Oh, and then when he comes, when he opens his yap, I about fell over. Yeah, one second. There we go. That's gone. I, I couldn't believe it. Oh, that was amazing. It was so stupid. Right before sentencing. Uh, yeah. You had a bad day, Daryl. Yeah, you, you, you had a bad day. That did not go well for you. And and it, I don't think it's going to matter, but... <sighs> throwing a hissy fit to the judge after all... Interrupting the prosecutor, and she handled it beautifully. Oh, Absolutely. I, she, she I mean, did. she just took it to get more on her high horse, which is deserved. It was beautiful. I, you know what? That was the thing. And, you know, I, I didn't want to interrupt her while she was on a roll. But that she did an amazing job kind of tying together why we spent the day listening to all of this. Mm hmm. And she did a brilliant job at that. Yep. And she was the one that turned that into a strong legal argument with all of his past history, which, by the way, 
multiple time loser, multi multi time loser mm-hmm. in three different states. Why the hell was he out? I, I just that one still drives me nuts. Yep. But uh, wow, she did a fantastic job, and you can tell she she's been wanting to get that off her chest for a long time. Yeah that 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 was uh, that was kind of a uh, surprising. I mean, we know he's crazy, but like he had behaved today. I mean, he, he was didn't get kicked out, right? He's an asshole. I mean, he was rolling his eyes and that kind of thing, but he wasn't not nearly as disruptive as he was during trial. True, but again, he did get kicked out. So, so yeah, that. just once. All right, I guess I guess noon tomorrow we're doing this thing. Yeah, let's do it. Benny, uh, tomorrow he's got three supposedly. Uh, so he started with twenty, went down to nine today this morning, and now he's down to three. And is three including him, or is it three and him? I was not clear on that, but does it really matter? Yeah, I mean, I know Grandma's showing up because she she was giving statements out that she's gonna give here. So I I don't, I, you know, I'm confident that she will do that. Mom might be showing up, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if baby mom is going to let the kid testify. That All might right. be one of the ones that got knocked out. Well, I, I got a quick stream lined up over on All my right. channel. I, I'm going to I'm gonna get off here so I can set that up. I'll probably start in, in, in just a few minutes here. All right. Shoot me a link. If, if, wanna, if you want to come over, I'll, I'll shoot you an invite. Um, it, yeah, which, is, gonna... which is funny. I was watching. I'm like, it's lighter. I mean that that the case I'm doing is 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 sad. It's a very sad case, but it's not nearly as sad as this. Yeah. No, I mean, all right. So it's yeah, it can't possibly be worse than this. But yeah, uh, yeah, I'm gonna do my little quick wrap up, and then uh, everybody head over to Law Talk with Mike for his. And uh, God, this has been a long day, but I'm glad we did it. Honestly, yeah. when it's all said and done, I really am. Uh, it's it's not easy, but yeah, yeah. And thanks everybody for coming out. It was it was very yeah, therapeutic you, for me personally. Yeah, and, and it, like I said at the very beginning, it is important to tie this all back together to what really happened that day, and hearing it from the people that were there and the people that were so heavily affected is, I think, very important. And you know, people have been saying it. It's easier to do that in a group than it is alone. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right, let me do my quick wrap up and then everybody head over to Law Talk with Mike. He'll be up in a couple minutes and uh, I'll see you guys over there. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, all right. Oh, let me catch some of the last super chats. Um, uh, Grandma's coming one way or the other. She's going to be there. Um, so we'll see. Eh, it's not a contest. People have different perspectives and people like different takes on things. There's nothing wrong with that. I like the way that we handled things. I, I love you all. So, you know, I wish him nothing but success. It's really not a contest. Um, but I was so, I just thank you all so much for coming out here. This was my biggest stream by far. Not even, not even close. I think it's probably double my other largest stream. So thank you all for coming out here. It really was, you know, again, I wish I could say it was a pleasure. It wasn't, it was a miserable experience in a lot of ways, but we got through it together guys. And, uh, you know, I think that I'm going to keep harping on it. I think it's important that we do this together and we get through it together and we did. And now they know. And it's sort of like, I was, talking the other day it's sort of like with the summer's trial you know when i went and visited the courthouse um you know that family found our video and it brought them a little bit of laughs and a little bit of joy and so hopefully maybe some folks from waukesha see this and they see 13 1300 people from across the united states and across the world that were there to commiserate with these folks and that really does mean something to people. And I, I hope that maybe that does something good. You know, that's kind of my sort of takeaway. Um, so, all right. I guess what I'm going to do since Mike's setting up his stream is I will do that last cigarette. And uh, I'll take anybody who has questions or whatever. Let me know. Um, 
Yeah, we got the UK, somebody from Germany said that they were there. We've had folks from all over. Um, it really has been, it, this was, this was a tough group experience, but I think, uh, I think we all grew a little bit closer through this. Oh Lord. But, uh, all right. So thank you very much, everybody. I really do appreciate it. Um, North Carolina, Australia, Prague. I mean, it literally is all across the world. Because they're deluded morons. I, I, do you need a better answer? Thanks, Annie. Um, I have to look into that one. I haven't decided quite yet, but maybe. Maybe, maybe. Um, yeah, we got Scotland. Somebody said Denmark. Yeah, Kathy, seriously, thank you so much. Kathy is an absolute MVP of this channel. I mean, <clears throat> everybody who got a, uh, a membership through her, please give her a thanks. Because she has been so generous today and it's been absolutely awesome. She always is. Commentary is totally on point. Absolutely amazing. Um, so, all right. Let's do a... Uh... No, not just Kathy. Knight also did it. I mean, there have been... Uh, just Judy sent some memberships. Uh, everybody's fantastic. This really is the greatest community on YouTube. I, I say that bar none. Um... Let's see. So, well, stay strong, I, man. You that you have an amazing community that, and everything during this has spoken so well of your of your city and your community. It really is something. Um, we have Belgium. So I don't know if anybody has some questions. We got another couple minutes. Thank you, Layla Acosta. I appreciate it very much. Welcome to the team. Welcome to the Ginger Snaps. Um, old man as well. He he donated some. These are the best people ever. I already got Florida covered, Janice. But thank you, everybody. Seriously, it really is awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah, this this has been a bit of a rough day, but we did get through it together. Honestly, you know, call your parents if they're still around. Call your grandparents if they're still around. I, you never know. I mean, everybody woke up that morning thinking they were going to a parade, and too many of them didn't realize that they would never be seeing their families and members again. That's really tough. So reach out to your loved ones. It really does. It really is important because, you know, I don't think anybody went to that parade thinking that imagining what might've happened. Yeah. Then text. You know what I mean? Yeah. And by the way, thank you so much, chat, for comforting each other and being there together. That's one of the things that I love seeing is the chat talking with each other. Because I really couldn't talk much because I didn't want to talk over these folks. But you guys were all there for each other, which was really awesome to see. And that's why I go back to you guys are the absolute best. You really are. You seriously, seriously are. Um, I imagine if he gets convicted to the maximum, they're just going to null cross the other cases because there's nothing more they can do to him.
Thank you for the super chat very much. I don't know necessarily what you're referring to, but I appreciate it. Have a good night. Um, all right. So we got maybe another minute or so, and then I'm going to head over to Mike. So I'm going to do the speak now or forever hold your peace. And I will see you over on that side if you're still around. Um, yeah, they could stay the case if he appeals this one. It's not going anywhere, but we'll see. They, they could do that. I, again, I don't see the appeal going anywhere, but that might be a smart way to do it. Um, let's see. All right, well, thank you again, everyone. I really appreciate everybody sticking around and seriously supporting each other. It was huge. Thank you so much for all of the new members, all of the gifted members. Yeah, thank you so much to the mods. This was a little bit of a tough one, but you guys, as always, did a fantastic job. So yes, 100%. Thank you to the mods. Um. Any uh, fun fact about John? I don't know. I'm not a particularly fun person. I can tell you I was crossing the street last December when I got hit by a car. It's like the tooth is kind of screwed up. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's not necessarily a fun fact. But, yeah. Uh, all right, guys. I'll see you guys next door over at Mike's. <laughs> no worries, Chelsea. I appreciate it. So thank you everyone so much. It's always a pleasure to see y'all. Uh, I'm trying to come up with some fun stuff after all of this. And uh, yeah, maybe maybe sometime later. Case is still pending. But yeah, all right, guys. See you over at Mike's. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for all the super chats, all the members, everybody. Thank you for the mods. Thank you for everybody being here. This was the most successful stream I've ever had, and I cannot thank you all enough. Even though it was a really tough topic, you guys made it what it was. It's not me. It's you all. I basically shut the hell up for most of it. But so thank you all. You guys are the best. Peace.